these as a source of pride. It'll show the kids that people care in the community, how they're doing, and how they're feeling, and to keep them safe and well. Matthew Love, the president and CEO of Nicholas Children's Health System. Great to meet you too. Met with Superintendent Dr. Donald Fenoy. Yeah, it was our pleasure to help out, you know. And Paul Beach County School Board Chairman Frank Barbieri. We are a very successful district because of the partnerships that we have. To announce the donation of 80,000 facial coverings valued at $100,000. It's a fabulous opportunity to, to two great organizations to come together, and um, there's nothing more important than our kids. Facial coverings will be used for children in kindergarten through the fifth grade. I mean, anything we can protect the health of our children and families, uh, I'm so excited to have partners that are willing to help us take care of those things. Healthy kids are the future of our community, and you know we need to take, take care of them. And it's a true privilege to be able to help uh, the kids uh, up there in, in the school system. This donation affirms a key lesson. It's important to wear your mask to stay safe. That's why these students are so appreciative of Nicholas Children's Hospital Foundation. Thank you. I'm Rick Blackwell for the Education Network, keeping you informed. Twenty twenty started off with a whole lot of optimism. West Boca High School ringing in the year in London. Schools throughout the district enjoying a fresh look thanks to your penny at work, plus unique measures taken in support of students. January ending on a high note with Royal Palm Beach High School's Jesus Armas named Principal of the Year. It's now outstanding to be the principal of Royal Palm Beach High School. It's a privilege. Our students shined in February's competitions, putting their, their knowledge to the test and exploring options for the future while also celebrating black history. And one young man learned he could charm a crowd. We cannot thrive as a district, a community, or a society without you. March started off by celebrating our Teacher of the Year and School-Related Employee of the Year. But soon, rumblings of virus are confirmed, and Friday the 13th lives up to all of its superstition. Schools will be closed tomorrow to release the last scheduled day of spring break, which is March the 27th. With one week to switch gears, in addition to spring break, you helped us lay a strong foundation for distance learning. We distributed tens of thousands of computers to students. We pivoted to Google Classrooms, and we served millions of free meals while our campuses were closed. Around the district, the call for help was answered by students, their technology, and a generous donation from our medical academies. May saw a big change in the way we send off our seniors. No proms, no fairgrounds, Instead, custom graduations is on tape with the help of every one of our high school principals. I am so, so happy for you on your high school graduation. We know what a special day gra graduation is in your life. Our students' accomplishments are celebrated despite social distancing. In June, words like Clorox 360 enter our vocabulary, and every effort is made to ensure our schools and buses are clean. Meanwhile, Dr. Fenoy takes part in the national discussion on racism. You know, those of us in power should use our powers for good, and those of us in power should use our power to make changes for the better. Congratulations. July is host to summer graduations, and teachers come up with creative ways to engage homebound students to, despite the quarantine. Thank you for joining us on this very important day in, in our district's history. Now we'll read my official recommendation to the school board regarding the reopening plan the 2020 to 2021 school year. Back to school took on a new meaning in August when the return date was postponed and the school year started virtually. Students, don't, don't be surprised if your teachers redecorated their Google classrooms and maybe even jumped on the bit emoji bandwagon. In partnership with the county, the district embarked on an ambitious effort to connect all students through an extensive Wi-Fi mesh. The new normal prompted the board members to adopt new policies impacting our students, staff, and visitors. 
and paving the way for the reopening of our schools. September saw the return to brick and mortar for nearly half our students with a comprehensive plan to keep everyone safe and moving in the right direction. In October, our long-standing showcase of schools gets a makeover, going completely virtual. And the district initiates more conversations on topics ranging from mental health to the return of sports. End of the month brings the start of football season and the end of era for the school board. The memories that I have from being in this district are things I can never, ever forget. In November, the first Hispanic woman is added to the dice. The district celebrates its veterans and reveals this year's Principal of Year nominees. Despite obvious challenges, we all find reason to be thankful. Now here we are in December, admittedly ready for a winter break. A time to recharge, reflect, and redefine the future with a new strategic plan and continue going the distance to together. We've been offering the course now for two, two years, but now we're going to take it to the next level and expand the program so that we can offer it to more students within the county. These are all skills that we learn in the class using Ping, um, you know, like trying to like, get your IP address from your computer. Cybersecurity Academy is going to um, grab a lot of software, a lot of curriculum that's becoming available to us, and they're going to learn how to um, navigate how network works function, um, and then also step up from there is going to be how to prevent and anticipate any kind of um, security hacks, hackers coming in. And the demand right now is high in this particular field and so students are able to also take industry certifications where they can leave high school certified in this, in, in this area and go out and get a job making really good money while they're possibly going to, to school and earning a degree. Just by being able to take this class, like just starting it basically, has already allowed me to like, like have multiple colleges like apply, ask me to apply. There's more jobs than there are people to fulfill those jobs. So the need to um, train students, people to fill those jobs is important and this gives us an opportunity to go in that direction. My role as principal is to, find, to go out and see what jobs are in demand so that I can bring the programs here to Santa Lucia and prepare my students for that post-secondary success. One of the things we're trying to do with our students is we're trying to build scientists of tomorrow. They only went to the one school, but it's their job to build leaders. To realize the opportunities that are out there, the various fields to study. We're actually participating in a program called a Scientist in Every Florida School. It's through the Florida Museum of Natural History, and what it does is it brings different scientists in on different topics that we're covering and allows us as students to interact, perform experiments, get a life experience in different fields of science. And if doing its job properly, it'll just take all of that pollution and it'll stay there and it's the pollute. I think it's just a really great opportunity for students to see that their careers in research and science and see active people that are actually doing scientific research in the field. We're trying to actually get them engaged, hands-on, spark that interest and build the next best scientist coming out of Western Pines. Persevering. Here we go. Get ready. Motivating. Flight is 99% preparation and 1% execution. Inspiring. We won't stop dreaming. Our Palm Beach County School District teachers are heroes. A visit to three choice programs, one in elementary, middle, and high school, provides an up-close look at innovation in education. 
Maria Sklar is the program director for the Boynton Beach High School Aerospace Science Academy. She brings in guest speakers. The operations are done through a computer. To talk to her students about a career in aviation. We really try to make it interactive. We want to capture their imaginations and try to help them you know, work through those ambitions and put pen to paper and really start working. Palm Springs Middle School teacher Francis Bermudez hits all the right notes. When he created this video of his students, this is our world. This is our time. singing together in harmony. So our objective was to show the kids that even if we're far apart, we can still do a concert together and still pre present something to the world that, wow, these are our students and this is what we can do together. And Brian Haran's enthusiasm for teaching. Awesome, 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 awesome. A big reason why his band students at Plamosa School of the Arts appreciate the power of music. It can change people's moods. So, uh, you know, turn on the music and then you're in a sad mood, all of a sudden you're in a happy new mood because of the music and you're dancing on, you're feeling that rhythm in your bodies. We are pr proud of Palm Beach County School District teachers who are ready for whatever comes next. Our job is to cater and make sure that everybody feels safe, that everybody has a good education. I'm Rick Blackwell for the, the Education Network, keeping you informed. This is going to be special, really special. Wellington Community High School senior Johan sets foot on the school's brand new state-of-the-art football field. It's my last couple of high school football games before hopefully college football, and I just can't wait to see what the season is like with my boys. The field is part of a larger project, a partnership between the school district of Palm Beach County and the village of Wellington, featuring multi-use field, tennis and basketball courts, and more. Students will enjoy the complex during the day, and the community will have access on nights and weekends. The, the village is going to be able to run or, or increase the number of their programs. It gives our athletes, our, our, our students, the ability to, to have top-notch facility. Senior football player Isaiah appreciates all it took to bring about this field, equipped with durable artificial turf, just like college and, and professional athletes use. I just feel like, like we are blessed as a high, high school and a community to have this field and the people that are involved into it. The district provided the land and the village of Wellington paid for construction. The village will maintain the complex. The biggest reward is seeing the facility actually being utilized. And in this facility, there's going to be no doubt that this will be utilized seven day a week. Oh, all, all the things that we're going to do on this field is going to be great. And, and I was like, ready.
It's really fun because you're learning about science, math, engineering. You're doing lots of fun experiments, working with the team, and it's, it's all just really fun together. Not only is it helping with that literacy background, but also in the area of mathematics and science, which is crucial in any form of educational studies. Science is one of my favorite subjects. You get to do many inventions, you get to make things. Under, underneath everything we are, we are all people. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's, that's what it means to live united. You're sweet, Tessa. You are doing great. She is impassioned about what she does. To her, PE is something that's just as important as math and English and science and social studies. So she and the other, other PE teachers put their art into planning lessons. We don't just throw out a couple basketballs and tell the kids play play basketball. No, they have structured activities, uh, physical movement, um, academic part of PE. There's a lot of stuff up going on. You're going to step forward and get your back knee to the ground. You know, for us, it's always an important subject. Your health is the biggest thing for everybody. So these kids who are sitting, some of them have literally been sitting since March. Right. You're going to lunge down. We need to get, get them moving. And then as you step up, this foot comes up. Physical education helps with social learning. Kids need, need that mental and physical break throughout the day. It's an outlet to reduce stress. It's an outlet to participate in activities and exercise. 
it's a benefit to everybody, more importantly our, our students that are on the computer for a, a lot of hours per, per day. Keep those heart rates up. We're starting to figure out the spacing in the gym. Um, right now the mandate of course is that the kids wear masks all the time, so we're going to keep, keep them indoors. This heat, it's the best option for us, so we have to figure out um, how to keep them safe yet moving, but at the same time, you know, how we do that, do that online as well. Whether you're in distance learning or going to return back to school, it's the concept of engaging the whole family with movement and physical activity. This is a great, great opportunity where students can educate their families on the components of health related fitness, how to improve muscle, muscle strength and muscle endurance, and then putting that into practice together in the evening. Skills Academy is a resource that we have built for, for our students and our families to be able to access on-demand assistance at home. It provides videos and on-demand help for them, for our students and our families to access in order to be able to learn how to get help, how to do math, how to work with reading, how to work with writing, science, social studies. It's really that, that resource for our families to provide support. All those times when, as a parent, you have to help your child, when you go to help your child, you, you do it, you provide the best assistance you can, and your student says, well, that's not the way my teacher told me to do it. Well, now you have a video that shows you this, this is how the teacher showed them to do it. And that these videos are on-demand, timely help aligned exactly to our curriculum. So we try to make, make it very easy for our parents and our students to access and families to access Palm Skills Academy. So if all students have to do is log into the portal and, and go to the instructional continuity tile. So in the instructional continuity tile, they, they get to via the portal. Once they log on to, the, to that, they will find all the resources they need from kindergarten through grade 12, and they can access the videos for every single core subject area. The videos can be very short. It might be two or three minutes, or they might be a little bit longer, five, six, seven, seven minutes, all depending on the exact topic that's being faced. They will be available in multiple languages in order to support our families. So they are available in English, in Spanish, and in Haitian Creole. And then additionally, we are developing them in, in American Sign Language to support our students and our families that are deaf and hard to hear. So we want to make sure that we develop resources available for all of our families. The benefit of Palm Skills Academy for our students is that it is aligned tightly to our district's curriculum. So it will follow along. This helps make it easier for our parents and for our families so they don't have to search wildly through videos or perhaps find a method that wasn't aligned to the way our curriculum taught our students how to complete a particular formula or how to do a particular skill. They know it's aligned to what they learn, their students must learn in the classroom. Last year in Royal Palm Beach High School, Dr. Jesus Armas, who took on the title of Principal of the Year. It's never, never lost something. This year, the show will be virtual and the anticipation is rising. Four principals are about to learn they are among this year's nominees and our cameras are rolling. Good morning. I'm Angela Moore and I am the Glades Region Superintendent. And good morning. I am Monique McTeer, the instructional superintendent for the Glades Region. And we're here today at the beautiful Canal Point Elementary School to recognize Dr. Hibbler. He's the nominee for Principal of the Year in the Glades Region. Yay! We are here today because you have been selected as the nominee for Principal of the Year for the Glades Region. It's the success you've had on the FSA for the last three years. You've shown an increase for the last three years, as well as your school grade improving to a school grade of a B. The praise still goes to my teachers yeah. and my staff. You know, those, yeah. those are the ones that 
have been working in the trenches and um, doing the, the, the hard work you know, that's needed. But without them and, and my support staff, you know, um, definitely my right and left hand, uh, it's just been awesome. We are here as a surprise at UB Ken Conview Elementary School of the Arts, getting ready to surprise Ms. Adrian Howard. Be recognized as the Twin Principal of the Year for Central Region 2021. So let's see if we can find her. Right here, she's in Building 7. Let's go find her. Let's Can keep her secret if around here. Hi, how are you? No, come on through, come on through. Come on through. All right, go upstairs. Gentlemen, welcome to the last official meeting of 2020. The board just included a closed executive session. We'll now go on to workshops. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage, page, palmbeachschools.org. We also offer a listening option which the public can access by calling 561 357 5900 toll free at 1-866-9330-7015. The meeting ID is 1561-880-11124, pound sign. We'll call the workshops to order at, at 3.50 p.m. 3.55 p.m. Uh, 2.55, I can't, can't see the clock, there's a glare on it. 2.55 p.m. On, on December 16, 2020, the Bass, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara Quinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. Here. District 3, Kim Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. She's here. We have quorum arm with all seven board members present. Also joining us on day is Superintendent Dr. Donald Fenoy. And with us, us in the audience here in front is General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael. See Mr. President uh, Alvarez here yet. I know he's hoping to be here. Board Clerk Carol Bess. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so please remember to speak at a reasonable pace. 
Will everyone please stand for the pledge to be led by Mr. Mr. Sook Superintendent. Superintendent, do you have comments? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. While we're looking forward to a brighter new year in the coming weeks, I ca cannot close the chapter 2020 without reflecting on all that we have achieved collectively. I'm proud to recognize the contributions, conviction, and dedication of our board members, our students, staff, parents, and our community members. Together, we navigated one challenge after another brought forth on by the pandemic. While our decisions weren't always popular, they were continually rooted in what, what we believed was the best interest of our students and staff. This board adopted COVID-19 specific policies. Our principals and faculty transformed our schools to accommodate safety protocols, as did our transportation. Our academic leaders developed, developed their, their robust distance learning plan, while also offering parents a choice of in-person or online instruction. And our teachers pulled, out, pulled all of that together, educating getting two sets of students simultaneously. Our mighty food service workers kept our children fit, while our school police and mental health teams kept our campuses safe and helped our children feel secure. Our tech teams achieved a one-to-one -one ratio of devices for students in need, expanded free Wi-Fi availability, and put a smart board in every classroom in our, in our district. Our maintenance facilities and environmental services team kept our, our district pr properly clean, even when it meant, meant working overnight and weekends. The list goes on and on. It takes a dedicated arm of support staff to keep this district running. And in the interest of time, I cannot name all the accomplishments of our remarkable team in this district, but please know that you are appreciated and your commitment is valued. I've also, I've also been humbled over the past year the profound generosity of our community members, business partners, local municipalities, and others. You have donated time, money, and desperately needed supplies and services. Unfortunately, because of social distancing, we are not in a position to hold the in-person recognitions that we have in the past. I look forward to resuming that formal way of gratitude when it is safe, safe to do so. To James Gravelos and his outstanding team at the Education Foundation, you are remarkable. You work, work, your work is tireless, yet you are continually striving to do more for our schools. And I thank all of the public speakers who attend board meetings to, to ensure that their passion is heard. Typically, typically, winter break is a time of joyful, joyful reunions with family and friends. But this holiday season will be especially difficult for many, many who have lost a loved one, fallen on difficult times, or are separated from family and friends. Our wish for you throughout the holiday season is as we move into a new and hopefully brighter new year, is that you'll be comforted by the warmth of loved ones near and far, and that you'll find inspiration from acts of kindness born from the season of giving. Look at the joyful expressions of thankfulness on the face of children as our school police officers share gifts and holiday cheer during their annual Shop with the Cop event. Our students also eat cookies for those who, who, have, who feel forgotten this holiday season. Our faculty decorated school hallways to brighten the day of students. And our teachers adorned classroom smart boards to bring a holiday smile to the faces of students in class and those learning from home. As your superintendent, I am privileged to be part of a school community that inspires such a caring and giving atmosphere. Let's take time to remember the holiday, what the holidays are all about and do what we can to protect our friends and family. Over the holidays, please remember to continue following some safety guidelines that will help ensure a happy and happy new year. Mr. Chairman, those are my comments for today. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Board member comment is McQuinn. Since last week, I usurped everyone else's comments about holidays. I'm actually going to pass this along to my fellow board members. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to say a quick uh, message of, of joy and love to everyone. Although this holiday season will probably be unlike any other, it's fitting to wrap up a year that's been unlike any other. Um, I, echo the superintendent's sentiments about 
the gratitude I feel and the strength I've seen from everyone at the district, uh, all the way top down, um, our students who have faced difficulties they never faced before and have continued onward, their educators, our staff, and everyone at the district never stopped working one day to make sure that everything was continuous, con con continuing. So I am so grateful for that, and I just wish everyone that I wish you moments peace, even amid the difficulties that we're all facing, wherever they may be, and connections with your family and the people that you love, even if they're virtual. And I hope that everyone um, can still look forward towards the joy that still awaits us next year when we hope hopefully come out of the woods on this. And for um, my community, I'd like to wish everyone um, en esta fiesta que renazca el amor y la luz de la esperanza, felices fiestas de Navidad y muy próspero año nuevo. Happy holidays to everyone. Happy New Year. Thank you, Ms. Mel. Ms. Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say um, again how grateful I am for everyone in this district and a huge thank you for everything that you've done this year. And I'm wishing everyone a happy holiday. Um, one of the things I've mentioned to a few of the upper level staff here is that one of my um, best friends lost her father, who was an Alachua County um, public school bus driver um, to COVID. He got um, COVID while driving the bus in Alachua County. His name is Ricky Davis. She wanted to make sure that I let you know his name. Um, he was a special person, and I, I, I truly did love him and her family. Um, and um, as we go forward in this new year, I'm making it my resolution to remember every day uh, the positions that we put the people in this district in. Um, and people like Ricky Davis, um, what they've been through, um, and what my friend Janice has lost, um, and how important that is. So I'm going to continue to go forward and hopefully mention his name a few times as someone that um, the school board um, has to think about when we make our plans for the future. So um, I do want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's out there and has gotten on a, on a bus and driven it these last few months, um, who, who has uh, showed up to the classroom and taught children, um, including mine. And uh, everyone who showed up in administration, because you guys uh, just impress me every, every day. What you do is nothing short of remarkable. And the dedication you have to the students of Palm Beach County just means everything to me. So I want to say thank you. Happy holidays. Be safe. And I look forward to seeing you all in the year. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. And uh, this morning I had the opportunity to be with the Palm Beach County Legislative Delegation I passed each of the board members the packet of, of the uh, morning uh, hearing session, and I, will, I had the opportunity to be with the Glades Career Readiness Roundtable for West Tech. And uh, the representation from the community of the Glades has been tremendous. Uh, we presented uh, this morning uh, an ask, an appropriation ask, for continuing the uh, CDL program at West Tech educational center. And when I looked at the review of the programs across the state of Florida, the big seven, most of them have big time uh, programs in CL with sometimes with as many as 60 trucks at many, many of these large uh, school districts. But, but this year we were able to get a CDL program at West Tech. So we had our appeal this morning and I want to thank the chair, Mike Caruso, Representative Mike Caruso, from the Palm Beach County Legislative Delegation and all of the legislators for really being interested and in saying they help West Tech to continue the CL program. One of the things they have asked for is to have a tour of West Tech. And we have agreed to bring them forth to come to West Tech to see all the improvements. The legislature here has been a part of that, the Florida legislature, and been giving monies to West Tech to open back up, to be where we are. So we are going to have a tour uh, from the request of our chair, our Representative Mike Crusoe, and I'd like to invite the board members to come when we do this tour. We'll, we'll probably have a little luncheon and a tour together to, to talk about the progress over the years. And, and I want to thank the city of Bill Glade, who stepped up to say that we will sponsor this, whatever it takes at the legislative level to ask for these appropriations. The city of Bill Glade, the uh, Tri-Cities mayors from Pahokee and South Bay, have stepped up to the plate to say that they will sign off to make sure that we get this money that we're asking for, and I hope that we will. So, so it was a great day today. I want to thank uh, Rita Solnet, our uh, legislative liaison person, as well as all of the 
the district employees who worked with the, the round table. They didn't just by themselves. You worked with the round table to get this ask ready, and we presented it today. And while I was there, I was pretty impressed with a group of, of young students, and they're called the Coalition Against Pig Poverty, CAPP. And the vision is to make sure that every middle and high school student have access to free period necessities. And these young students that, that's out there with the legislators, the legislators, to, to say, we want to do a better job for our children in our schools. Uh, uh, Rithika Kachem is the founder of, of Girls Help Girls, and Megan Enrique is the founder of Period. They are talking to the leg legislators today. They have a foundation that stands behind them, and they're looking for volunteers who will help make sure that we have products in every school for, for these girls. They're also putting a put, uh, budget together so that, that we can have funding to start out with our Title I schools to make sure that children have the necessary products needed for their safety. One in four teens in the United States miss classes due to lack of period products. So it was impressive seeing these young students out there presenting their ass to the legislature today, the state legislature, and I just really love it. And lastly, I'd, I'd like to say this is really the end of the year. Today is the seventh day of Hanukkah. We'll be celebrating Christmas soon. Kwanzaa right behind. Please know that it's a time of peace, joy, and healing. And I wish you the best for a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andrews. Dr. Robinson? Ms. Uh, Vice Chairwoman McGraw? Thank you. So every year um, during the holiday season, I am hopeful. And this year is no exception. I, I am the perpetual optimist. I know that this year is going to bring us the end of this horrible pandemic. And you're going to see a community that was stronger than when this all began. I, I too thank the people who have assisted us this year, our village, which came through this year during our time of need. And I know that coming forward next year, our, our partnerships with the county mission and the state legislative delegation will be even stronger as we work together to advocate for the needs of Palm Beach County residents. And to those celebrating, and thank you, Mrs. Andrews, but tonight, today is the sixth day, and sundown is the sixth night of, of Hanukkah. So Chag Seyach to those who are celebrating. Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, and most of all to everybody, a happy, healthy, and safe New Year. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Board members, I had the honor of welcoming on behalf two brand new officers today to our very fine police department. I'm not sure how many we have now, but we have, we have lots. And, uh, and I'm, I'm always amazed at, at the quality of the, of the men and women that we're bringing into our police department. Uh, they bring, many of them bring lots of experience with them. The younger ones uh, certainly are eager to, uh, to, to, to uh, work with our children. So um, I, I I'm, I've been privileged to be able to meet most of the new officers as have been sworn in over the last couple of years. Um, I join with my colleagues in thank thanking the entire district staff uh, for all you've done to help us get through a very trying period. We're not through yet, but hopefully, as Ms. Brill said, the end is in sight sometime in early next year so we can get back to some normalcy. The other thing I'd like to, to, to do is, uh, this is Fairbanks, would you stand up, please? You all know Dottie Fairbanks. She works in the legal department. Today, we are celebrating Dottie Fairbanks uh, is having, having a work anniversary today. And Dottie has served as the school district of Palm Beach County for 55 years. I think when she joined here, we must have brought her as a baby in a stroller when she started her first, first day of work. And she, she certainly doesn't look old enough to be have been here 55 years. I think you said you and Mr. Shaw played together as children? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Back when they didn't have electric lights, lights mostly gas lights in the building? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for all your years of service to the school district. We appreciate it. You're welcome. <laughs> Superintendent? Yes, sir. At this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Mike Burke and Heather Keys for our FY22 budget workshop. All right. Thank you, and good afternoon. 
Uh, we have a very festive budget workshop for you today. I, I could not think of a better way to get us on to the holiday spirit than pouring through the district's budget for a little while here. Uh, and as many of you have commented, you know, 2020 has certainly brought its share of uh, challenges. The, our budget process and our budget planning is, is you, can, you can add that to the list of uh, issues that have been complicated by, by this pandemic. So we're going to get in that today. The, normally we'd be just kicking off the budget process for next year, but today we need to spend a little time on uh, multiple budget years. So uh, I hope to conjure up some ghosts from budget past, budget present, and budgets yet to come as we <laughs> try to stick the theme here. Uh, anyway, so we've got a lot of good information for you. I'll go ahead and jump in. On FY21, uh, we were anxiously awaiting an executive order. Uh, that came, came out on November 30th after the Thanksgiving break. And, you know, that order was, it was a lengthy order. It had a lot of components to it. Uh, one of the big things we were watch watching was would we still have the flexibility or would parents and students have that choice to continue on online instruction for the same semester? And, and, and that was included in that. Parents do have that choice. There is a provision, though, if students are struggling in the online format, that we are to reach out to those families and try to bring them back into the classroom. Uh, there is a, a waiver process if families are adamant that they're not coming back to the classroom, but that's one thing uh, we're working through. And then there was uh, a plan that had to be submitted. And this is a, like the spring 2021 education plan. And all school districts across the state required to have a plan submitted by yesterday, December 15th. And those plans basically commit to providing a full array of services for our students. Uh, to help, help, you know, avoid any further learning loss and, and to catch kids back up. And, and Dr. Sheffield's our expert in that area. I've, I've exhausted my knowledge. Uh, I'll move, move ahead to the, the financial piece of the executive order. Um, and there was a financial con continuity component that essentially gives us a one-year reprieve on our concern about the enrollment loss and the fun funding implications. So we were, you know, you re will recall, we had a, had a, whole, a commitment from the governor in executive order number six that would hold us harmless for the first semester. Uh, the, what they've done is basically extended that for the remainder of the school year. And it's, it's great news, right? This is well, welcome news. Uh, this is, you know, helps, you know, get us out of the wood for this year, but it's, we still have a concern looming with our enrollment for, for next year. So there's no expectation in that the state will be able to continue this uh, and everyone's budgets will reset based on actual enrollment for next school year. This year they came up with new methodology because most of the state was, was declining. They're going to hold districts that are in declining enrollment. They're gonna hold us to our original projections and continue to fund us on that. And then whatever, whatever growth is out across the state, and it's expected to be relatively small, that the, all districts would then uh, do like a prorated amount, prorated contribution to fund that growth elsewhere. So for us, the difference which was, we were looking at a potential loss of 30 million the, the estimate provided by FDOE reduced that adjustment down to 1.2 million. It is an estimate. We're not going to know the true num number until probably April, but I expect it to be $2 million or less, which is, which is a far better scenario than that loss of $30 million. So, uh, you know, I haven't always been a fan of Commissioner Cor Corcoran, but I think after this, I, I may have to consider putting him back on the Christmas card list. Because uh, this, this truly, they listen to... The, you know, Dr. Fenoy provided input through FADS, I provide input through Finance Council, and they, they essentially took our recommendations and embedded them in the order. So that was really a pleasant surprise. The enrollment, you know, I keep harp harping on this, but this was significant. You know, we lost basically, basically 10 years worth of enrollment growth in, uh, when we opened schools this year. Uh, we, we, we dropped over 7,300 students, and uh, this is not a Palm Beach phenomenon. And this is playing out across the country. Uh, but it's still a, a, a significant concern. Uh, and we hope, I know uh, I'm working with my colleagues here, that, that there's a lot of effort going into re-engaging our students and trying to make, make sure that uh, some families have gone to private school or home education. There's others that may just be disengaged entirely, and we've got, we've got to work to get these kids back in school. So that's, that's going to be, you know, that's ongoing, and uh, we'll be doing even more when we come back in January. On COVID, you know, you guys, we bought a lot of stuff. You know, we bought 20, 25 million worth of computers to get to the one-to-one -one ratio. And then within the COVID grant, 
we're charging a lot of things with PPE. Uh, we did some special development and extra duty, duty days to get the school year started. We, we were, were able to charge our summer program last summer to the CARES Act grant. Uh, we provided internet hot, hot spots to try to make sure every student had access to the internet. Uh, a lot of extra cleaning, you know, face coverings, wipes, disinfecting wipes for the classrooms, plexiglass. You can you see, but the, some of the numbers are staggering of how much materials we've had to buy. Uh, the bottom line is we expect to spend about $45 million in COVID-related costs. And that's, that's about $10 million more than, than our share of the Initial CARES Act grant. And last week, you know, we, we were excited. We had an item to put on your agenda where the county may be able to help us out with those costs, up to $10 million. We're, we're closely watching the, the stimulus conversations on Washington now, and Ms. Solnit has been providing us uh, periodic updates. And there's one kind of unintended consequence there. Uh, uh, and we're going to get, Ms. Canoose is going to get into the CARES Act more, but I do want to point out that uh, one of the provisions in this, in this stimulus package being discussed now would give counties and states another year to spend any money they've received already. And if that comes to pass, the county will no longer be able to give us $10 million. They're going to hang on to it and use it for, you know, future COVID costs within Palm, Palm Beach County. So that, that was one negative component of what, what's being, being discussed there, at least on our side. The, the, the much, much bigger upside is that there may be stimulus for K-12 education again, and it's going to be badly needed. Um, on our reserve, you know, we worked hard. It's adopted budget that you, you passed in September to include reserve for what, what we were concerned about potential year state cuts and, and additional costs related to COVID-19. Uh, we started the, you know, the $42 million reserve, and it currently stands at $42.4 million. And so there's been, uh, the monies have ebbed and flowed to some extent. We did have to tap into it uh, for certain costs. Then we, we also resized, we were adjusted our school budgets based on count day to, to recover some savings. You know, we've, and we did that through a, through a softer general approach. We, we tried to make sure we didn't take, uh, leave schools in you know, a bad spot where they couldn't serve their kids. So we, we took a much softer approach, but we, there were some uh, adjustments and basically it's kind of washed out. So we, so we still have that $42.4 million uh, for this current year. And with, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our renowned economist, Ms. Heather Knust. Uh, she's going to provide an economic update date and then start getting into the forecast for next year. Well, it's good to see you all in person because my, my last meeting was virtual. So it's good to actually physically be here and be out of my relegated A wing that I could <laughs> enter into the C wing over here. Uh, but I am going to try to quickly go, go through the economic update because much of this information you've already heard. Uh, we'll start with um, the GDP, looking at the national GDP, and you might wonder why are we looking at the national GDP if we're here in Palm Beach County? Because if you look back historically, uh, the Florida economy um, trends and, and, and follows the same trends as the, the GDP. Um, if we get into look into more, more detail into the quarterly changes um, that have occurred in GDP after um, the pandemic, um, there was a lot reported about that significant decline in the, in the second quarter of 30%. Um, and then subsequently in the third quarter, there was a significant spike in the annualized GDP of 30%. So you would think, oh, well, we're in a, in a great place. You know, we're kind of back to normal. Um, but if you were to take that and, and, and take those assumptions, um, forecast it out, um, this analysis was performed by um, PF, PFM um, using uh, Moody Analytics as well. Um, using uh, optimistic assumptions related to the trends of the rollout out of the vaccine um, and um, that we're able to, to stem tie to the spike in, in new cases, even taking into the consideration that significant increase in the, in the third quarter, we're still not projected to be back, back to pre-COVID levels until the end of 2021. And if you take into account more pessimistic assumptions and outlook, it could possibly go into 2023 to 2024. Um, so there is still a bit of time that it's going to take for us to recover um, from this pandemic. Now we're going to look at unemployment. Um, so this is a historical look of unemployment. I'm looking at the green line is Florida, the, the red line is US. I'm going back to the 1970s. And you can see that you know, with the pandemic, there was a significant spike that was really precedented related to, to the pandemic increase in unemployment. And then there was also a resulting 
significant drop, um, unprecedented as well. Um, so we went up to you know, 14%, down to 6%. So the question is, what is really going to ha happen with unemployment? Are we going to see it continue to decline with the rise in new cases? Are we going to see unemployment increase? There's still a lot of uncertainty. And you're hearing every day on the news, we get updates as to what's going on with new cases. And, and we know that there's been a spike, not only here in Florida, uh, but nationally. So now we're going to shift closer to, to looking you know, back in, in Florida and the revenue streams that really impact K-12 education. And K-12 is funded in Florida primarily through two revenue sources, uh, property taxes, and the state portion of the funding is funded through general revenue. And when you look at general revenue, the largest component of general revenue, uh, the largest appropriation is education. Education includes not only K-12, but it also includes higher ed. It's everything related to, to education. And when you look at what, what revenue stream make up general revenue, the largest source is sales tax. So that, that's why we're always looking at and focusing on property taxes and sales tax. So now digging a little bit deeper into sales tax collection, um, these charts show comparison year over year, 2020 and 2019, month to month, so you can see the changes in, in, in sales tax collections. So when our state shut down, you see a, a significant decline in sales tax collections. The chart in the upper right-hand corner is statewide. I also have Palm Beach, and then we also have Orange County, so you can, you can sign to see the variation. You can see as our state reopened, uh, sales tax collections started to increase. We had a slight dip, you know, based on the most recent information in August. Um, and Palm Beach County is, is following the same trends as statewide. And based on the most infor recent information, local information we received, we're expecting to see in Palm Beach County an increase in sales tax collections. And we hope to see that trend statewide as well. But if you go and you look at Orange County, it is a very different picture because they're so de dependent on tourism. So they have a much sig more significant gap that they need to make up. And that last chart on this slide, I'm sorry, it is a little busy, but I was trying to get everything on there. Um, um, you look at the bar chart and it's state visitors, because you know our, our state is very dependent on tourism. And this chart shows a projection out to 2030 as to what our projected state visitors look, look like. And we're not looking, it, it's projected that we'll get back to pre-COVID -pre levels of, of visitors until 2022, 2023. And that is statewide, it's not specific to any county. Um, so now uh, focusing on property taxes, um, property values um, in FY 2021, um, they increased by five and a half percent. So they have stayed strong, but the property values are assessed in January. So that was really pre-COVID. So waiting to see what's gonna happen in FY 22. Um, so there's already been an adjustment in the gro growth. Um, originally, uh, property values were, were expected to grow over 5% as they have been over the past several years. Uh, but that, that uh, growth has been revised down to 1.6%. So it's still not a projected decline, but the gr growth is less than was anticipated. And in looking at um, local property taxes, it not only impacts our FBFPP funding, it also impacts our one mil referendum that, that we have. So if we do potentially have a decrease in property values, we will have a corresponding reduction in, in revenue. And not only re related to the referendum, but also capital projects. And when you're looking at property values, there's really two components of, of property values, that residential piece and the non-residential piece. And in looking at the residential, like I mentioned, that has been relatively strong. But it is going to be dependent on employment, what ha happens with unemployment, um, as well as whether, whether we're going to see an increase in foreclosures and then therefore it's going to have depressed, um, depressed the values in, of, of the residential property. And when looking at residential, you know, the composition of, of taxable values, residential properties make up 73% of the statewide taxable values and 80% in Palm Beach County. So that, that's what those two numbers are. And then looking at the non-residential, non that's just the remainder. And when you're looking at non-residential, the largest component of non-residential is commercial property. And we know commercial property has been hit hard with this pandemic. So we've seen a lot of retail stores close. Um, and then also 
a reduced need uh, for, for office space because a lot of uh, businesses are seeing they can have workers work from home. Um, so they're, they're starting to use that out as a way that they can reduce costs. Um, so we are uh, going, going to be monitoring what is, is happening with the, the commercial market and how that's potentially going to impact uh, property values. So we have a lot of uncertainty, which is the whole revenue outlook and where we're going to stand, um, not, not only nationally, but in the state of Florida. Uh, so looking at the legislative timeline, in November, we got a new Senate president. We have a new House speaker. Um, in the coming months, we're going to be getting um, the new revenue estimates for the state, and the, and the governor is going to be releasing his budget. Because we're in an odd year, 2021, uh, the legislative session starts a little later. It'll be starting March 2nd. And the last day of the session is April 30th, you know, it's assuming we don't have any special session. So what is the legislative session going to look like for, for K-12? What are the priorities going to be? So based on the most recent EDR report that came out, out um, I believe it was in August, the state of Florida is fa facing a $5.5 billion dollar uh, loss in revenue in FY21 and FY22 combined. We have, since that projection was released, received some very positive information in general, general revenue. That general revenue is coming in higher than what was originally uh, protect, uh, projected in that estimate. Uh, so, so, whatever, so whenever we have months where revenue is coming in higher than what was originally projected, that will help, help to reduce that $5.5 billion estimated shortfall. We also have to go back and look and see, well, what has, what are the priorities of this, the new Senate president? And if we go back to his speech, um, he was very focused on making sure that Florida has a structurally balanced budget, meaning if we're going to have a reduction in revenue, then our appropriations have to be reduced as well. And we, we have to make sure that we're not using one-time money in order to balance our budget, the Florida budget, because other, otherwise we're going to put our bond rating um, at risk, which is something that they're not willing to do. Uh, but he was also clear that they're not going to just be making cuts. They're also going to have to make investments as well. Was education going to be one of the priorities of the legislature where they're willing to invest and not, not make cuts? And so that's something that we're going to ha have to be able to, to wait and see. Um, so we have, we are facing significant uncertainties going into FY2022. Not even just FY22, but really FY23 and probably even to FY24. Um, as Mr. Burke stated, enrollment is how we, that, that, that is how we build our budget. That's how we know what revenue we have. So knowing, you know, you know how much of our enrollment is going to rebound is going to have a significant impact um, um, for the upcoming year. We have, to, we have to make sure that we align and right size our budgets to make sure that our, our staffing aligns with our enrollment. Uh, we have to make sure that we comply with the state mandates. We know that it's, it's been a priority of the state um, to fully fund and to, to right size um, RS to bring down that rate of return to what is recommended. So we are expected to have another increase of about $15 million this year. And that's probably gonna, gonna continue in the upcoming years as well, because instead of doing, doing a large hit, trying to do gradual, uh, reductions, all those, those gradual reductions are, are still very significant, um, but they have, have a, a, sick, a significant amount they need to reduce in order to get to that re recommended rate of return. And then in, in addition, looking at the textbook adoptions, um, textbook adoptions cost more than the textbook categorical that we're receiving from the state. So that the, the, the categorical has not increased um, a lot and aligned with the increase in our actual will spend. We also have that outstanding um, charter school referendum litigation um, um, that we're waiting to hear the final results on. And with COVID, we just have now an increased normal operating costs. We have increased costs for cleaning, incre increased costs for PPE, increased costs for just, just the supports of, of supporting the children in this transitioning time, you know, you know to try to uh, support them in, that, in the period of learning loss. So with all these additional costs, we are, are hopeful um, that we will see an additional federal stimulus. The most current federal uh, pr proposal that is out there to allocate $54 billion to K-12 education. 
If we look at how CARES Act was allocated and allocate this $54 billion in the same manner, we would receive about $135 million. So that would definitely help to support the district um, getting through uh, the, the next few years um, for, uh, for shortfalls and potential shortfalls we're going to be facing. And like I said, this is not just an, an issue for FY22. We have challenges in FY23 and beyond. We know we're going to have increases in FRS. And we had the most recent voter-approved um, increase in minimum wage, which is going to have the most significant, it's, it's going to start having a significant increase to the district in FY24. So with all of this uncertainty, we're planning on having board workshops and student advisory committees every month beginning in January through the month of June to make sure to keep the, the board apprised and go through this process because we, we know that we're going to have significant changes uh, throughout the year. So with that, that's the end of our presentation, and, and I wanted to open it for any questions. Questions, board members? Ms. McQuinn? Mine's actually very simple. Do we, do we have any idea statewide how many students we're down? You know, I know that for next year, the state's projecting that they'd be down 83,000 students. But that's a, that, that's a mitigated number, assuming you know, a good portion come back, you know, the kindergartners that may have heard a year. So it would be significant north of 83,000. And we're still waiting on final October numbers to come back. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't have an exact, exact number for you yet. But when we get out, we'll share it with the board. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And so oh, I, you probably don't have any hard answer for this question, but um, assuming that once we have a, a new president in place and we're going to have, to have a new education commissioner, do you have any feel for some of the funding issues that we've experienced? Um, I know there's talk about restoring things that were cut. Um, if you don't, I think that's something that we're going to need to get, get frequent updates on because I think we're going to see a big change at national level, um, which may be able to help us with our title schools, with, with you know, some of the other grants, which may, may be able to help our budget. So, you know, hopefully you'll be able to have some information. I know it's, it's premature, but, you know, January is around the corner and hopefully we will we'll see some changes rather quickly. Yes, that'd be nice. I mean, as of late, that the big federal components are, you know, Title I, IDA, they've been relatively flat. I believe a, a continuing resolution was passed by Congress just to, to keep, they kind of basically kept things in the current state, but yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic we'd see, we'd fare better with a new Commissioner of Education. Mr. Burke, you, you mentioned the, the students that are missing. Um, maybe this isn't a question for you, the superintendent staff, one of the other staff members, but um, I'm still here, hearing the word we can't find 2,500 of our kids. I mean, do we have any clue where these where, the, where these kids are at? Out of the 7,500, I guess we're down. We've located 5,000. 5, I understand 2,500. We don't know where they're at. Are these could these be kids that are sitting at home doing nothing? That we're that are not getting educated at all? Does the district have any idea where these kids are at? I'll take that one. So, Mr. Barbieri and the rest of the board. <clears throat> We do, this is what we have come to realize, that your last point, there are, are some kids that are literally just at home whose families are not making them engage in the educational experience. We also discovered in the last couple of weeks, we have kids that, that are now sitting with relatives in other parts of the country and, and other parts of the world, to be honest with you. Um, and, our, and Mike's team actually brought that to our attention because we, we, we could see kids accessing their distance learning platforms from Bahamas and Jamaica and a few, from other, other places. So. Uh, and I think a lot of families, you know, sent their kids places where they felt like they could be safe. And so that's what we don't have, have like, we can't pinpoint every child, but we know based on the feedback that we've got that, that that's, that's sort of summation where we think we're missing 2,500 kids here. So, Mr. Superintendent, what is the district doing to try and f find, find the kids we don't know that are, they're not, not logging in from anywhere? All right, so Mr. Tierney and his team, um, led by um, Claudia Shea, they cr created a district-wide initiative to reach out to those families so ba based on the data that we have from uh, the deputy superintendent's team. So each regional office and their um, principal supervisors and our principals are reaching out to the, the kids that they have on hold to identify where these kids are. Uh, our school police department is in some of our mental behavioral health support systems 
are make, making home visits and knocking on doors. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Andrews? Just to follow up on that, at the last Royal Palm Beach uh, Education Advisory Committee, some of these kinds of questions came up, there, and, and I think it was addressed uh, by Dr. Sheffield and uh, Mr. Tierney the other night. So you're going to be bringing something forth. Can, can you share with the board what you're going to be bringing forth that's going to drill down on the same kinds of questions that we're ta talking about, the lost students, uh, those may be uh, homeless, as well as what's coming for us. We will be able to have a deep dive into this. I'm absolutely, Andrews, and again, th thank you for the opportunity on this evening. And the, the conversation that we had is around um, a lot, lot of the components that's within our spring assurance plan that talks about the re-engagement of students, um, those that we have not been able to connect with, but those that are connecting, but not on a daily basis which surely is impacting their um, academic performance. And one big piece, which is Assurance 6, I should say, and one big, big piece that we're doing is starting um, January 4th, second semester. As you are aware, we do have, have social workers within the district that are currently working within our regional, um, off, within our regional areas. So to assist, because what we, we have found in terms of trying to make contact with our parents is that the you know, the hours from 7 to 3, 3.30, many of our families are working. And what we've, we've also found that not just our families are working, but they have their, their, their the old, older ones, they're working too to help provide for their families. So we have really, um, I'm thinking outside the box, and we have our, our social workers, and we have about five that we have identified that have agreed to, to work what we call part-time system to where they, they will be working evening hours. So we will have a set of social workers in each area that will, will be working directly with regional offices, working with, with the principals, assisting in regards to those students that we're having a hard time making that connection with. Mark Howard, that team, they are, you know, we, we are able to drill down. So we're going to be, be providing that data, looking at the students, also, also working with school police that with some of these home visits to where we could actually go out, make that connection outside of the normal school day to try to um, um, reach our families. That's one piece. And, and the second part to that is that we're continuing to, to research with our high school students. We're finding that's where a lot of those students are working because they have, have to help provide for their families and they're needing some accommodations after school hours. So if you would think back in regards to some years ago where we had the sunset program to where, where our high school students were able to come and attend classes um, on non-traditional school hours, and so one of our schools I know, West Boca, um, continue with that, that program, and they are funding that program on their own. Well, we're looking at putting a sunset program in each, in each of our region. That would program would not be ready to go when we start on January 4th. But with the social workers working after hours, working with school police, make, making contact, actually going to doors, try, trying to re-engage, those are two big of parts of our initiatives. I also also have June Eastern that team working with our homeless population, McKinney Venta, that Mrs. Andrews is make, making reference to. Also with our teen, teen parents, you know, our pay centers, um, and you know, and working with Harvey along with our ELL students because that's a large group with our Maya centers. Those students have um, and fam families that are having a very difficult time. We have have that team that are out there in the community. We are here hitting doors. And we realize that we have we have to get outside of the office and. And, and try to also so do some of this work outside of our normal day, and it's our immediate plan. Follow up, Ms. Sanders. Thank you, Chef. I think you covered it, but I just can't let it go without saying to Mr. Bur Burke and Heather, uh, I'm always impressed with you and your work in the budget arena, uh, sitting on those council calls every Friday, and you know, all of the board members are welcome to be on those calls, but I've been sitting on them all summer, yeah. And uh, Mr. Burke, your leadership with, with the Council of Great City Schools, with all these big urban districts like New York City and L.A. and all over, you've been leading the charge. So when I get, get on those calls and I see this information that you all have put together for us here in Palm Beach County, we're cut up. So I want to thank, thank you for all the work that you have done, because we are in a crisis all over the United States of America. But I can say, even though we may, may not have the money, we really do know 
why we need the money and the <laughs> money we don't have because you've gotten the information to us. So keep the great work. And I, I always feel so proud because uh, Michael Casserly and the council and the executive board, they always raise about Palm Beach County's budget thank leadership here. So thank, thank you. you. It's a great network. I'm so we benefit greatly from the board being a member of members of that council. So it works both ways, but thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Robbins. Thank you. Um, I particularly like, like the way you present the game. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions that come from budget into the, my favorite area, which is academics. But, but, um, but I want to go back to the, these missing students. So one, do we have, do we know the demographics of the students that um, don't, haven't lost a bit at all? And those who, I, well, I know we have the data. I think maybe the board should see the data, right? So, and those who log on inconsistently, as well as maybe updates on demographics of those who are coming into brick and mortar. Um, so, the, the other thing, though, is... Dr. Robinson, would you like for us to prepare something for the board to, to see that data? Yeah. In fact, if you could do that after the holidays, I'd appreciate it. Um, and then the other thing is I think the board maybe at some time, at some point in time, if we haven't seen it one-on-one, -on -one, that we see um, the tool that our academic team is using to monitor the rigor of instruction, because think of distance and learning, because I think that that's terribly important. Um, but I really believe that no matter what we do, is long as it's a computer, that it's not going to be as engaging as face-to-face. -face. That's just my, my belief system, and, and my grandchildren tell me that that's true. So um, do, do we have a spreadsheet when these social workers and law enforcement are not on doors and, and, and trying to find these children? Do we have a spreadsheet of those children that, like, this baby hasn't logged on at all. We knocked on the door this day. Nobody answered. We knocked this day. You know, Sally Sue answered and said the baby was Georgia or whatever. Like, do we have a spreadsheet like that? No, it's not to that extent. Um, they do document right now with the at school centers in regards to every, every attempt that they've made. But so noted as we start this new pilot on January 4th with our, our part time and system, the after evening hours, I'll, I'll definitely make note to work with Jim and that team in regards to trying to make certain that we are capturing um, many of those, those components in which you will make reference to. I think, I think it's also important to note part of the, the plan we submitted yesterday, that documentation is more than it acquired. So absolutely. Okay. And then the other thing is, is and in that same documentation, I, I would say show who's in private school, who's homeschooling, and, and then also we can get a feel on if they plan to come back when, at what point when the pandemic is, is gone or, or like what, what the thoughts of the decision-making adults are around coming back to brick and mortar. And, um, and then also, um, if they don't intend to come back, why? Right? Because I think that we, can, we, we might, for those who, who have, have the means, and who made a conscious decision to go, for example, to a private school or to a charter school or something. The, the question is why? Because we need to understand that from the, from the parents' point of view. If it's just simply because they, they opened the brick and mortar before we did, okay, got, got that. I would expect them to come back when, when things get back to whatever normal is going to be, right? But, but I think we need to hear more from the parents who, who left so that we can... Um, meet their needs and, and get, get them to come back and then we'll spin into Mr. Stubert's budget, right? The other thing is, you know, I've said this for years and I'm going to say it now, we need to hire some more grant writers. I mean, there's money there. I, I, and, and, and in my world, like, in days gone by, I don't really know if we're still doing this, but it's like we ex expect teachers to write grants for whatever, like, their, their projects are. There's some larger... 
did some larger projects need to happen that might not happen across to all elementary science teachers or something? Somebody has to have the nerve to dream of it. I mean, somebody needs to have them be able to take dream and put it on paper for the grant that they saw so that, so that they're monitoring the horizon, which we get those giant grants. We have those the grant writers who write those big giant grants, but there's some medium-sized stuff that's out there. And everybody and their mother is saying the word equity right now. And I think that we need to have grant writers who go at all that money that says equity for our post-COVID recovery, academic recovery plan. So I just, I, I, you know, I mean, I can, I can start sending these grants to people because I see them all the time. It's be crazy because I want to get them. Um, and, I, and I think our, our academic team has some, some very good ideas on how we could use that money um, to recover academically from COVID, but I just think that we need to, to look at how to get more good writers. Um, and I think that'll be it for my presentation. Any comments? Mrs. Andrews? And we all know about the COVID slide, and we're he hearing, uh, and this goes probably to Dr. Sheffield and Mr. Oswald, about a lot of children who are failing uh, who have fall, who have uh, fell behind uh, academically, and uh, will be close to summer programs pretty soon. And I just really want us to have something in place that we're providing some support for these children before it's to the point where they have failed everything and they actually repeat the grade. So I don't know what the plan is, but we I'm hearing parents telling me, and I'm talking to the areas that there's so many children failing everywhere. everywhere. And, and we've, we've got, got to figure out what, what we're, we're going, going to do to help. help. The, the other, other night, night at the uh, Royal Palm Beach Advisory, Advisory meeting, meeting, the parent was, was talking about many of our uh, upper-level students in the advanced courses falling behind because of, of uh, 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 distance learning uh, and brick and mortar and simultaneous mm -hmm. teaching and this and that in their home, and, and the teacher can't keep up. So as a result, some of these children are falling apart. So uh, hopefully there's be some money in the budget, Mr. Burke, because this is going to be a big need as we talk about this COVID slide. It's real. And now I'm beginning to see, to see parents call me to say, my son is failing. Uh, what are you all going to do about it? And I'm hearing the reading office tell me that they're trying to find why are all of these children not signing in. They failed, and they've got a report card now that may show all F. So I know we're going to need a lot of help because we, some of us don't know where these, these children are. Well, Ms. Andrews, um, I think that's a, a follow-up, and I'm sure Keith has something um, to, to add on to this. As we talked last evening, um, um, to your point, we are working on, as a district, the Student um, um, Academic Support Plan. And we call it the Student, student Academic Support Plan because we are creating, um, we're creating a system that, that's going to help combat um, many of the instruction gaps that we're seeing over a period, period of time because this COVID slide is real, and we know that we're not going to be able to close the instructional gap this summer. Um, um, it's going to take some time and some years. So, and with them, we have created the threshold and what we'll be looking at in terms of identifying our students, utilizing the, the MTSS, the multi tiered approach, um, which would then allow us to tier the schools and so forth. But again, I'll go back to saying why we're calling it the Student Academic Support Plan, because it's going to be um, looking for those innovate, um, those interventions, those strategies, and the acceleration um, pieces to help with all of our students because it could be on grade level, on, on grade level, and those students that are above. All, all of our students have been impacted with this COVID loss. They all will benefit from in regards to what are the next steps, what are we doing as a district outside of the core instruction to come back the losses. So um, Mike and the team, you're right, they will be coming um, and working with the group immediately after the winter break. We started this development in stages. It correlates very well with the next phases of, you know, the make your choice that we had talked about um, earlier in the fall. And I know on Friday, um, we will be doing, um, we will be talking with our parents and with our communities in regards to what are the next steps and what that's going to look like and how, how we are committed to supporting the needs of, of our students. But I can assure you, and when, when I look at the timeline and thinking back, I think we, we have a timeline of that third, fourth week of January to where we will share the very draft. Um, with the board in regards to what are we committed to and how, how are we are going to combat this loss that will align with our strategic plan and so forth. But I think Keith may have some piece that goes with that as well. 
I think you covered it well. We've been working on a comprehensive approach. In addition, part of the executive order, we will be reaching out to all our families. To your point, Ms. Andrews, who are failing a couple of courses in their core uh, core classes, as well as has, have limited engagement with signing into the portal for student attendance to invite them to come back, come back to brick and mortar if it feels safe to do so as, as required. Your schools have been working on this and we've identified a number of students who would benefit being back, back in brick and mortar and we can still do that in a safe manner for our families. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Can I just ask a real question about school food service? Um, I understand that they are having some of the toughest times they've ever had. How does that um, impact the overall budget? It, is there a, a place where we start having to backfill some of the issues of them not being able to, to produce as much food and feed as many kids? Or do we have to make cuts there at some point? What does that look like? So it's, it's, it's a great question. The uh, food service service has been hard hit by the pandemic because they're basically reimbursed on the number of meals they serve, and despite their best e efforts to get meals out to the whole community, it's it's far down from previous years. So, the latest estimate was that the food food service budget would lose about five million dollars this year, and that's we've already taken some steps to mitigate that loss by shifting some costs to the general fund. Fund food service the last couple of years had been chipping in about three million dollars a year on custodial costs to help keep the cafeterias clean. We've shouldered that cost for both last school year and the current school year to take pressure off the budget. Uh, we, we have lunchroom aids in our elementary schools that cost about $700,000 a year. Food service was not gonna be able to afford that this year, so we picked that up in the operating budget. Um, the stimulus talk are going on in Washington do have, do have a, a component that would help with food service, and it essentially provide about four months worth of reimbursement. Now they've been, in, out of normal operating conditions for about nine months now, so it's not, I don't think it's as much as people had hoped, but that that may soften some of the blow to food service. But we're watching that really closely. We are fortunate in normal times in Palm Beach County, the food service budget's completely self, you know, independent. They're, they're self-sustainable. They, they never need, need help from the general fund budget. Uh, this is a first. And we're watching it closely because as they deplete their reserves, we could get to a point where the general fund has started to subsidize the meal meal program. And I know Ms. Momblu is working hard to try to avoid that. So, and Ms. Paul as well. As well so. Any other questions? Dr. Robinson? Okay, I'm gonna just <laughs> dig into this some more. So, so, you know, we're gonna talk about equity in just a minute and our mission and all that stuff. So let me tell you about some inequity in, in this whole, um, COVID land and education. So, so some communities have the wherewithal to have like neighborhood ed educational pods, right? And so, so, you know, if you are so fortunate that, you know, one parent can stay home, that parent might be able to supervise the distance learning of several children in the neighborhood, right? So we know that's more likely to be a higher socioeconomic area. Lower socioeconomic areas may not be able to pull that off, right? And so I'm, I'm saying that to say that as part of our COVID recovery plans, I don't know, I'm, I'll convert to your language in a, in, in a few days, I think, but as part of what I, I call the uh, COVID recovery plan, then we need to look, look at leveraging our relationships with in entities to help make sure that such pots are available to students in poor communities. If, that may, if, if you follow me, right? I mean, I wish we had, we had done this in March, right? But it's never too late. And and we know, to Dr. Sheffield's point, we're not, they're not gonna recover the loss over the summer. We also know, uh, and so these pods be used for after school, school programs on a go-forward basis if we are able to make those, those arrangements. But we also know that, that the children we were failing to do a good job with educating other ones who are most likely to have fallen disproportionately further behind. I appreciate the fact that, um, you know, the vast majority of these children are not progressing the way they would have if we hadn't experienced this pandemic. But there's some who are like falling off the cliff, right? And so I hear you, you talk about the MTSS approach. I appreciate that tier one, two, three, all that. But I just want to be real clear. I'm not. We're not talking about all. We have to make sure that we disproportionately 
apply whatever resources we have or our agents or community partners have to, to those who are in most need. And then, and the last thing I want to say is we did, did those grade level essentials um, at the start of the, of, the, of the pandemic. And so I think that we need to promote them because we want parents to be active participants in, in this educational process, but we need to give them bite-sized chunks of things to do, right? So I'm hoping, for example, that as part of the ELA textbook option, we will give parents the adult sight words and say, do five cards a day or whatever. But we have to be really, really very intentional about reaching out in a respectful way and partnering with our parents. And the last thing I'll say right now is that I want to thank Dr. Sheffield in advance because she's participating in a town hall meeting tonight with a group called Golden Parents and the Coalition for Black Student Achievement. Exactly talk about, from the parents' point of view, what we do to prevent them partnering with us. And so um, she's good enough to listen and we appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Any more, more comments? Thank you, Ms. Canoose and Mr. Burke. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and holidays to both of you. See you after the break. Mr. Chairman, before the next group comes up, um, I like. I think it's important for us to quickly pause and reflect on the work that, work that has been known over, done over the past over the last month. It's important for the board as a collective, for the district staff that will be tasked with implementing this work, and for other members of the Palm County community who are also invested in this work. At my direction, district staff started working behind the scenes on a plan in late September to more formally engage the entire board in conversations around equity prior to the development of our next strategic plan. An external grant was secured in October that allowed us to search for a consultant with expertise in engaging school board equity work. We were lucky enough to secure Mary Fritarkis in November, and she has been instrumental in helping the district get this work off, off the ground. We kicked off the equity, mission, vision, and strategic plan, plan conversation with the board with, the, with a board work workshop on November the 10th. The board, along with our student representative, Santiago Alvarez, and myself, participated in a short self-guided equity study for the remainder for the remainder of the November, which was followed up by a one-on-one -on -one debrief with Mrs. Fritarkis. The board, Mr. Alvarez, and district leaders dedicated four hours on December 4th as part of a board retreat to engage in courageous conversations about race and how current systems continue to perpetuate inequities as a result of structural and institutional racism. Today, Mrs. Fortakis joins us one last time to engage the board in discussions around our current mission and vision and potential revisions that may be needed to ensure equity will, in fact, serve as a pillar for our next strategic plan. This may also require us as a school district to take a hard look at our current systems and structure to see if organizational changes are necessary to achieve the desired outcomes as outlined by the district's existing equity policy. Although we have taken many foundational steps over the last month, and beyond to well position ourselves to move forward, I want to remind everyone that the hardest work still remains ahead. I've shared this before, I will share it again. Equity, equity is, is meaningful work. Meaningful work requires a significant investment of time and, and a high level of commitment from everyone in order for it to be successful. I look forward to our last conversation today. Since the board's input is critical, critical to ensuring myself and my leadership team and the district as a whole implement the appropriate next steps identified today. And with that, I will turn it over to the Chief of Staff, Mr. Ed Tierney. Chairman Barbieri, Vice Chair, Mrs. Brill, School School Board members, Dr. Fernoy. I am very pleased to be here this afternoon to help facilitate part two in our series of board workshops on vision, mission, mission, equity, and strategic plan. Joining me at the table today are on Ms. Kathy Villavicencio. Joining us remotely is Ms. Mary, Mary Fertakis. The board has worked individually with Mary. You've worked, worked as a collective, and I'm very comfortable saying we are for fortunate to have her as a partner. We appreciate her being here this afternoon, and we look forward to working with her throughout the afternoon on this important work. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tierney. Uh, can you hear, hear me? Yes. Sure. yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to lead, lead us off uh, with a practice that we um, started in, in, at our last meeting, which is to do a land re recognition. And part of the reason for that is, is that we cannot have any discussion about equity without framing it in the context of the uh, people groups, our indigenous uh, tribes, who were the first people to experience inequities um, when Europeans started to come to this continent. 
Uh, so you, you are all on the lands at this, uh, the, the historic lands right now of the, the Seminole and the Tequista tribes. And I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Duwamish. Um, I gave you some historical background on, on uh, both the Seminoles and the Tequista and the Duwamish at our, at our last gathering. So I um, will, will move forward into land recognition. I would like to honor the tribes who have been the historic stewards and caretakers of the lands and the waterways that we live on, we play on, that we have been benefited from, continue to benefit from, um, and acknowledge that our education system has not served to them well uh, in the history of this country and continues to, to um, cause problems for them uh, based on historic um, historical issues that have happened related to genocide. And um, at that point now, I will turn it back over to Mr. Tuning. Thank you, Mary. At the, at the November 10th board workshop, the board made it clear that prior to embarking on, on the strategic planning process, the board wanted a strong foundation upon on which to build that plan. That foundation is an, is an analysis of our vision and mission to determine if we're still comfortable with it. It's a definition of equity, which will then transition to the creation of our strategic plan and then, then operationalizing that plan to make measurable, achievable goals that will guide this district over the next half a decade. So you can see the short-term planning process, define mission and vision, will transition ultimately into the long-term planning process of the strategic plan and how we operationalize that. The next slide is agenda. We'll go over that very briefly. I just want to, want to call your attention to bullet two, the workshop. That's the, the most important word on that agenda. This is designed to be a true workshop today. This is not a staff presentation. We have significant amount of time reserved for the board to analyze and discuss vision, mission, determine if you're still comfortable with that. If not, determine what it should be. We'll revisit the board identified barriers to achieving equitable system. We'll discuss the proposed revisions to mission and vision, should there be any. We'll look at a timeline that's added in this proposal already and make sure the board approves and look at next steps. And at this point, I'll turn it back over to Mary for check-in. You're mid, Mary. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we are also going to check in with each other as we did um, last time and, and Mr. Barbier, I'm going to have to uh, rely on you to help move this along because um, um, I cannot see the members of the board um, with the, the, the structure that we have. And so what I would like to do is if you could go around your table um, and I'll leave you to start at whichever end you like to at uh, Mr. Bar Barbieri's direction. And uh, our check-in is I'd like to know um, if you could state word or a phrase on how you're showing up to our workshop today. Rather than start at one or the other, is it anybody want to go first? No, so go ahead. Don't want all my words used first. Um, appreciative that we are being included in revising or whatever the strategic plan um, up front and, and that it will be centered around equity. So appreciative. Sayala. Hi, Mary. I'm showing up um, refreshed and empowered, ready to get to phase two of our educational session together to reframe how we can better serve our community. Mr. Swetfield. Thank you. Um, I'm actually so super excited. I loved your um, sample missions. I thought that was really, really um, it was really hopeful, and I, I can't wait to incorporate some of your ideas into our current mission. So I'm very glad to be here, and I'm glad that we are moving forward on this, this journey. Thanks. Mrs. Andrews. Motivated, motivated uh, to uh, share my opinions with my fellow board members, uh, motivated to continue to listen uh, and review what other districts have been doing. Uh, Motivated to make some changes uh, for the school district of Palm Beach County as, as it relates to make sure that we pr provide the equity that needed for all of our children and staff and community. Dr. Robinson. My word is skeptical. 
Vice Chairwoman Brill. Thank you, and my word is enthusiastic. I am enthusiastic regarding this new course that we are going to be traveling along. And I'm last, Mary. I, I'm, I'm just hoping that this work works for us because we, since, I, since I've been on the board, we revised the mission and vision one other time. It didn't seem like it made much of a difference. So I'm hoping this time we actually get, get to where we need to get. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. I um, um, appreciate that. And at this point, we're going to um, pull up the slides that we have for you. And, um, and uh, Mr. Barbieri, I'm going, going to need to rely on you since you can see your colleagues um, that if there are comments as we're going through that um, you know, uh, raise those for me. So the, the next thing I want to do is um, refresh our memory about the norms that we agreed to for having equity conversations and having this conversation. And so as a reminder, we are here to speak our truth and that uh, what that actually means is that all perspectives are valid and all perspectives are partial. I can speak from the perspective of a white middle-class woman. It is my lived experience and it's valid. It's also only one of many, many perspectives. And once I've had the opportunity to share it, I, I need to sit back and listen to the many other pers perspectives that are represented um, in our conversation today. The um, next one is, is to stay engaged. Um, you've already been going for a while. And um, I know as a former board member, this is, um, it can, can be challenging to stay engaged. Um, but this is this critical work for uh, moving your district forward to make it so, so this time, as has already been said. Um, so just encourage you to, to stick with us um, for the next couple of hours. The ne next one it was to expect to experience this discomfort. Um, as I've shared with you, I feel that I will have failed as a facilitator if everyone who's participating today doesn't experience some level of discomfort um, in our time together as, as we're talking about things that hopefully will be um, causing you to think di differently, um, challenging perhaps some uh, beliefs and practices, and that we, we should be embracing that discomfort because it means learning and in a learning phase. Um, also, also want us to be aware of our intent and owning our impact. Um, may not intend to say, say something that's um, uh, that lands as full on someone, but if it does, just own it, um, say thank you, and uh, we move on because this, um, when we know better, we can do better. And it's a gift um, when pe people will share with us how they may have been harmed by something that's been said, um, and it takes courage to do that. The uh, accept and expect on closure. Um, um, we are on a white Western time frame today to get some things done and, and to try and get you to some consensus on um, a couple of items. But at the same time, we're going to get as far as we get because this is an ongoing conversation and you get as far as you get and we have to be okay um, if you can't tie everything up in a nice bow at the end of the, um, our time together. And, and then maintaining our learner dance um, and, and, and being in a learning space to work for, move forward together. So now I'm going to hand it off to Kathy. All right, so before we dig in, I think it's important just to frame, um, as Mary said, there will be some non-closure today, but what things we need from the board, make sure we can keep moving forward. I know there's a holiday break, but there are several of us who are working behind the scenes to make sure we keep the momentum um, when we return and make sure that all these pieces fit together. You know, you heard about budget, you heard about student academic support plan, the strategic plan, and all these things need to coalesce or, you know, we won't get to where you know, the board has said they want to be in terms of changing outcomes for all of our students in the county. So uh, today, Mary will take us through a discussion of the mission and vision statements. Very excited to hear board members already talk, talking about some of the pre that we sent along for y'all to start thinking about this prior to today's meeting. And then uh, um, after you debrief that we work, uh, trying, trying to just determine the extent of revisions, definitely starting that process now, now but you know, of course we are time limited. so determining how much more time the board will need to engage in this piece specifically. And then as Mr. Tierney shared, reviewing an overall proposed timeline. Again, talking about how, how all these pieces fit together. We're really trying to be forward thinking at the direction of our superintendent to make sure that um, we can keep it moving forward and make sure that it's sustainable and long-term. So, so 
Again, you'll see there at the bottom, your input is needed today to make sure we have that clear direction so we can um, you know, have our implementation PPs ready to go after the, the holiday break and y'all can see how all of this work is moving forward based on your feedback, particularly as it relates to the strategic plan. Um, so without further ado, Mary, please take us on our mission vision journey. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, so where we're going to start now is, is um, you did some wonderful work at our last session and, um, to identify different types of barriers that you were seeing and you were um, asked what, what would an equitable system look like and what needs to overcome for that to happen. Um, I commit to taking these back and, and looking at uh, categories or to be able to categorize them as they, there were things that were emerging. And, and these were the four that seemed very clear um, in all of the comments that you raised. So um, you were provided with a document as part of your pre-work that highlighted the, the four categories um, that um, seemed to be very, very uh, clear to me that things were falling out into. And I just wanted to very briefly go over, you know, some why about that and want to give you an opportunity if you have any comments about this overall. Um, first of all, every single one of your, your comments was included in uh, um, the documents that you received. And um, some of them are, are repeated because they fall, they fell into to a couple of categories. And so that's why, why you, will, you will see them because I did not want to lose any of your thoughts. And um, I also included it in there because I wanted to tie this back to our prior learning um, so that we, that we get used to thinking in, um, in stru structures. And that um, I put in parentheses when we our terminology definitions and that conversation, uh, there were these four categories incorporate several of these different types of racism. And so again, wanted to tie it back to your prior learning. And so for the changing people's belief systems, which is culture change, this isn't going to be involving um, elements of interpersonal struggle and institutional racism that need to be addressed. For equitable resource all allocation category, um, and I, I do want to point out that, that um, as I stated before, resources are more than dollars. You've just had a budget presentation that, that is you know, highlighting what some of the challenges are, are going to be. So I would just like to remind us that, that the resources that we actually have are more than just the dollars. Um, they include the power and the privilege that you bring with your, your, your positions, it includes the way time is used, the way spaces are used, and how your people are distributed through your, your system. So all of these are resources you have available to you. Um, the third category was opportunities and access, and this was en encompassing not just academics, but extracurriculurs. And the um, fact that you can have a nice list of opportunities for your students, but, but if they don't have the means to access them, it's the same, same as if they're not actually there. And so having some intentional um, conversations around barriers are existing around both opportunity and access um, going forward will be in, in order as part of your work. work. And then the, the fourth one was social, emotional, and whole child needs. Um, and this is impacting both of your staff and the types of uh, trauma that, that they've been experiencing um, during our time of COVID for the last nine months. Um, as well as the impact and how that's rippling out to your, your um, students and your families. So that was the, the, the reason why they, these were broken out the way they were. Um, I'd just uh, like to, get, to give you an opportunity to, if anyone would like to com comment on um, how this landed on them and if this is something that makes sense to you, you to be, as a, be a reference as you're moving forward. And Mr. Barbieri, Barbie, I'll have to uh, lean on you for calling on people. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm watching the board members. They didn't want to speak on anything. Doesn't look like any comment. Oh, Mrs. Whitfield. I, I just wanted to jump in real quick on theme one because I think that's something that can really um, work on here as a district. Um, the mandatory racial equity PD for all staff. I think um, to me, when we were talking about that, um, just making a, a list of expectations from the board to our staff that says where we would like them to be and making that 
a, a requirement rather than now I think all we do is we ask people if they would like to and, and so I think we can change the culture for from here only if we really do do send down our adaptations so I just I, just, um, I love the way that that was all written and all the, all the different comments that the board had and I, I think it's a great theme in changing the culture for, for this district Mrs. Andrews I think when we talk about cha changing people's belief system, uh, we can train a lot of people, but if they don't really believe or trust or have confidence in the training or the system itself, we go nowhere. And so I believe that people have to have trust. Uh, they have to be given the opportunity uh, to uh, be comfortable, to share their feelings, their knowledge, and you have to work together. So I just think when we, we talk about the culture, our culture a lot of times goes with, with uh, going to a work, workshop and getting trained and then you go back and it's over with or you're supposed to em emulate what you've been trained and do the, the job that you have to do. But it takes a lot more in-depth work to be able to change the culture and you have to understand the folks who you're trying to work with and they have to understand you. Ms. Ayala. Something that stood out to me and was, I guess, hopeful and positive was, was I think from the theme shared here by all of us, we're, we think a lot of the same things need to be addressed. So that gave me some hope that we can land on a, a successful path moving forward because a lot of the ca categories, we say very sim similar things. Obviously, there are distinctions, but I think we all know what issues are in getting to the, the point of instituting a, a culture that no longer accepts what isn't tolerable anymore is where we want to go. But I feel positive that, that at least we were on a very decent foundation for where we want to see, see the district in the future. Mary, I see no more hands if you want one. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Ms. Ayala, for that comment, because I was hoping that by doing it this way, that that, that would be one of the things that would become apparent is, is that you have a lot of convergence on the, on the board and the things that you want to see. Your approaches uh, or specific priorities may, may be different, but they definitely come under these umbrella areas and uh, areas. And I think that, that that's really a positive place just to be able to start um, and to continue working forward. Okay, we're going to dive into now um, some work on your, your mission and vision. And I do want to um, just acknowledge up front that this is what you are. We are starting. A little bit later um, than intended and that, that you have already been doing some work and are also pushing up on um, the fact that it is the sixth day of Hanukkah and um, I just wanted to be uh, cognizant of the time and so um, Ms. Brill I would just invite you um, to keep us on track it looks like we're we're get, getting off a little bit so that we can keep moving and be respectful of uh, different people's um, uh, constraints right now and things that are important to them. So uh, with that, um, Kathy, can you pull up the slide presentation again? And we're going to uh, do a little framing around the, the mission and vision, much of which you already have with you, with you with the pre-work documents that were sent out. Um, I hope that was help helpful for you. This is a best practices for being able to maximize the time that the board has together by doing some of this work and reflective work um, so that we can come together and in the ground running and, and hopefully be um, efficient in our uh, use of your time and your, your effort. So um, what we have um, with just, again, making it very clear in defining terms, um, what mission does and what vision does. Um, a mission should be describing core work and responsibility of the school district, not the core work of the, the board. Um, so this is, is, is your global um, umbrella that you're, you're working under and what you're trying to address. The vision is, is a way to describe your preferred future and it's generally done in a five-year year plan, which is what you are planning to do with your upcoming strategic plan process. The vision can be ranged anywhere from some of the examples I provided to you, one or two sentences to actual page long statement where there are specific things that, um, that people um, on the board want, wants to call out 
um, that are the how that the, the vision is going to be um, being worked towards. Um, and many times there are, there is a tagline or there, you know, there is something people use as a, a, a phrase to express it. And um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't raise something for you right now. Um, so if you haven't experienced this discomfort at th this point, you probably, some of you will with what I'm about to say. But I would invite you to take a look at this slide and the tagline that is on the slides. I don't know um, how, how long it's been um, in place, but it says more everything you want for your dear child. And we're talking about equity. And in our definition of equity, it, uh, equity is based on need. It, it is not based on what we want. Um, and I'm looking at this, and again, as an outsider looking in, what I'm seeing on this is that um, children and students are actually centered in this. Um, this is focused on um, the you being um, parents, guardians, um, others. And so I, it was just, I, I couldn't not comment on it as I was watching this because this is part of the branding, it's part of the messaging. And um, this is something that you would need to interrogate as to whether this is actually reflective of what you're trying to do in creating um, an equitable system that serves each and every child. Um, um, Mary, Dr. Robinson has, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for pointing that out, but can we, um, can we center around word equity? Cause I, I don't remember, you know, I have a fault memory, but at least today we did center around the word equity. Can we have, make sure we all have a, have a common definition of what equity is before we try to put in our mission or vision, vision or anything? And I'm thanks for raising that. Um, in, in the, the timeline that we're looking at, one of the th things that you don't have in the district is a working definition of, of equity. And um, because a mission and a vision does not define what equity is. Um, this is work that we can, can do. Um, it was very made very clear um, with the board's input. Um, and actually go to the, the next um, slide, Kathy. Um, it was made very clear in the board's initial in input that it was noted that equity was not included in the vision statement, though the word is in your mission statement. Um, and so, so what, what can happen is that um, in because you're not defining it here, you can do the work of saying, this is what we want to be accomplishing as you're writing your mission and your vision. And um, in the time that's gonna be presented, you'll, you'll see that the work related to defining equity for the district is going to be going on, on simultaneously. And that when that definition is com completed, that it's got to be added as an asterisk after the word in your mission and your vision and underneath that your definition that you're working from um, is placed there. Does that, yeah. so well, you're the does that help for today? Yeah, you're the expert in this area, but to me that's like using a word in the definition of the word. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I'll walk with you, but it doesn't make sense to me to not at least have a conceptual definition of what equity is I get to down the road I mean we really gonna have to dig into the different all the multiple variables that, that at least the way I see equity lead to, to equity you know to equity the, the noun as opposed to the next equity verb right but I mean I just I'm just not really sure that we all have conceptually the same thing and so, so I'm gonna put it out there. My the definition I'm operating with is that we bless them according to their need. That we provide the resources, and and the system, whatever the system has to offer, get each child to where, where whatever our stated expectation is. That's what I'm operating. Yes. I I just I, I just I don't know. I just think that we need to conceptually agree to, to something. 
Um, I, I thank you for, for providing your definition and, and you've actually hit on the core piece of what equity is. It is based on need. That is the key word within any definition of equity. Every one of the board members identified um, different areas of need when they were doing the um, identifying what the barriers would be to have an equitable system. So, so you are starting from that commonality. Um, the issue for all of you is how, um, when you're talking about need, what are the, the elements that are incorporated in that? And that is the, that is what should be um, encompassed in the definition that is being worked on. I mean, you, you are fortunate that you have um, a committee that has been engaged in this work and it has been doing some um, uh, and, and has been doing some pre-work with this that is going to be also presented to the board. And you know, my uh, in the past in the conversation we had on December fourth, I said it was um, we made a clear dis distinction between equality and equity. Equality is based on sameness. Equity is based, based on need. And there's consensus around that as a, a foundational concept. So um, my hope is that by, by taking that as a foundational concept, as we're looking at addressing needs, that this is what's going to inform how you um, are we're looking at both your mission and your vision, and then getting to the specifics of what your definition or of what equity means for your district. Well, that is does that um, will that address the, the your concern for the purposes of, of our work today? She says yes. Yes, that Mrs. Whitfield. I just wanted to go back a little bit to your tagline comment. Um, it's funny because I was actually looking at it today in one of the PowerPoints um, earlier when I came here, and I it kind of didn't sit with me great, great either. And I think really it's more about marketing, and it's really showing um, a time maybe four years ago when we were really in competition with the charter, um, and that was a conversation we had constantly. Um, so it was trying to show that we were, you know, better than the best choice for them. Um, but for staff, I'm curious, is, is that part of the discussion for, for the equity work is to change, change things like the way we market ourselves? I, I think that that will come out of this discussion and further discussions and work workshops on, on how we'll change marketing behavior, language, budget, budget organizations. So I mean, I think it's possible, okay. it's probable. Thank you. All right, Mary, Mary, go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so Ms. Kathy, if you can pull back up the slides that we were on. Okay, so um, going back to what you had originally stated where you raised a few issues, uh, the pre-work that you were given was to help you dive into this a little bit more and uh, to try and coalesce some thoughts that you have around what this could look like. And so, so our task today is not to completely either rewrite or wordsmith what your current mission and vision are, but to surface either thoughts, words, concepts um, that should be considered in any revision to these two um, foundational pieces of your work. And so you were you were given a um, couple of questions to reflect on. That um, again was uh, trying to cue this up, up for you to be able to um, have a fairly robust conversation in the time that we have um, by doing a little thinking around um, uh, any any considerations, words, and language. And then we're going to do. We have a, a um, Google document that we've prepared since you need to do everything in full group. Um, setting and I think Kathy, if you can pull that up, uh, what our intent is this is to provide just the the framework for you to be able to have, have the conversation, taking looking first at your mission and any, any thoughts, concepts, um, words that you would like to consider um, as part of a revision, and um, Kathy will be our note taker and will be adding these in. So. We've set this, this up with your current mission as um, uh, a way to, to have a reference point. And then um, taking the information that you had a, ch a chance to either read or reflect on in the, the pre-work um, to generate a list of some of these th things 
you know, with mission, and then we're going to do, do the same thing for your vision um, with, with the addition of wanting um, to get input from you on whether you are, are interested in a vision that is a short um, couple of sentences like you currently have, or, or whether you would like to uh, in, um, give some direction on categories of the how that you want to see the vision um, implemented it would each have a, a short paragraph, like a couple of the examples that I've provided for you. So um, that's, that's what we're going to be spending the next um, 40 to 40, 45 minutes on um, to try, try and generate some things that will then, then be taken out um, to work on and to get some consensus from you on um, words, phrases, and concepts that are, are resonating with you that you'd like to see included. So let's go back to the top of the screen and we'll dive in on the discussion about mission. And uh, Mr. Barbieri, this is where I will need to defer to you to call on your colleagues um, as they'd like to, to um, state things. And then just remember we have somebody taking notes in real, real time so you can all see this. Um, and then if, if we need to repeat something, then um, um, please bear with us so we can capture your thoughts. Mrs. Whitfield. Thanks. Um, I, I, like I said, I, I looked, looked at this yesterday and um, got really excited about one of the missions. Um, I just want to uh, start off just saying, I was talking to my, my husband about this and um, he said, well, what's your mission now? And I was like, um, it's world-class education, something, 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 something. And I um, was here when we made that um, part of it the last time we did this. So um, I felt like if I couldn't recite it to him, and I help make it, um, that doesn't, doesn't really bode well for the length of it. And I feel like a mission should be short, short and sweet and really say something. Um, so, so what I wanted to say is I really love the first one that you, you put in there um, about every student in Carolina Public Schools is known by name, strength, and need, and graduates and graduates prepared for the future they choose. It's, it's so student-centered, it's so short. I actually, actually really like that it's a very low reading level. The, every word in it is really easy. Um, to remember and say, and I think that really speaks to every child in our district so that everyone could see it, um, something like that. And I love the strength, name, and need. It just uh, uh, just meant so much to me because it really speaks to all the different groups we have. So, so that was, that's just an opinion I had when I read it. it I, I felt very strongly about that one. Some of the other ones are longer and they kind of include a lot of other different pieces, but um, I would love it if um, it became a thing in the, in the district where everyone felt like they understood our mission and understood their role in working towards it. And really, really, this talks about kids and that is just, just so important. I mean, I can see it on walls everywhere we go through the district. So something along those lines. Vice Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank just, you. Uh, just one, one quick comment. I'm, I want to comment on your notice, noticing the language in it and the accessible language. This is a school district that, that has 120 languages spoken in it. That was very intentional. Ms. Brill. Thank you, Hugh. So Mrs. Whitfield and I were very much along, along the same line of thought. Um, I prefer a shorter mission statement. I felt that it was too verbose to start with. And I was trying to wordsmith and come up with something. And, and actually, um, when I was looking at it, for me, I mean, what I looked at, and you, you may not, all of you may not agree, but I was thinking the school district of Palm Beach, Palm Beach County is committed to empower each student to reach his or her, her highest potential. That taking the words from what we have and just focusing on that as our mission. Because I think that sums it up. It up. Ms. McQuinn and Dr. Robinson. Reflecting now on um, what, was, what we opened with that was saying our school district are, is committed to the examples of the equity centered mission statements begin with every student will, will or we are committed to. To me be, being we, that's just implied um, inclusive of, of everybody. So it's, I think it's something we want to start with because both of ours begin with the school district of Palm Beach County. County. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, I also like the first example of the mission statement. What, what I think of is we see you, right? This, 
and this actually came to me from school visits, but where we see you see the gifts and talents you bring, we see your greatness, your wholeness as a human, and and we want to help d develop that, or we want to develop that to to what you choose it is, not, not what I don't particularly like the uh, um, the language about full potential because I don't know who's de determining what your potential is, right? But but I like the one about the prepared for the future that they they dream of. I love that. And I think that this this ex example embodies the we see you kind kind of a philosophy. So so far far that's that's the favorite one I've heard. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Ayala. Reading through the mission statement for me, something thing that I think has been touched on previously, um, it has the word student in it once. It just didn't focus enough on what, what our actual mission is. And looking right in front, front of us, focus on the buys is ahead. Head. Write up a quote from a former superintendent of the district. And I think that talk, talking about language that incorporates how are we going to break down any and all bar barriers to Dr. Robin's point that potential can be subjective and we have to make sure that we're aware of that how are we fostering an inviting environment for everyone um, and how are we delivering for our students and our employees regardless of circumstances that sur surround them and something that uh, I noticed in the i hope i don't don't butcher this north clackamas schools clackamas thank you <laughs> um the link that you sent on their hr page it, it said, uh, the North Clackamas School District strives to create an inclusive and racially affirming environment that welcomes and values the diversity of our staff and students. We foster fairness, e equity, and inclusion to create a workplace environment where everyone is treated with respect and dignity. And to me, that was significant because um, as Dr. Lakava knows, our HR departments are the core of our culture. They're the core of any organization's culture. And I think that starting where we, we start with students and their priority, but it has to, for me, extend out to every single person in, in this building, every single person in our schools, and to everyone that interfaces with us. So that one really stuck out to me. And I just think we have to make sure that we're including language in our mission statement that is much more clear and concise and inclusive on what all of this mumbo jumbo actually means when it com comes to student achievement and support. Mrs. Andrews. Thank, thank you. And I was looking at Roseville Area school, Schools uh, Equity uh, Vision, and it reminded me that we need to make sure that we're respectful of, lear of, of a learning environment for every student. And I, I think about the family uh, and the staff members, regardless of the race, gender, uh, and identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, ability from the home, a first language, religion. I think we've got to dig because when we think about e equity, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the needs of each individual and they kind of spelled it out of all the different kinds of children and families they had in their school dis district and that it's going to be respectful learning environment for every student for success. And so you've got to know who your students are, know where they come from, and make sure you're providing the necessary uh, academic uh, uh, experiences for all of them for a level of success. Mrs. McGuinn. I'd like for us to um, decide early on whether we're going to start with our students' will, or in other words, does it focus on, on students or does it also include our employees, our parents, our communities? Um, I think we need to make that decision because it can get really long and it shouldn't be really long. The strategies that we employ can be long and specific. Just, I think we need to make that decision. Mary, let me ask you a question. Um, shouldn't the mission statement somewhere and there use the word each 
I mean, that's our core business is to teach. So um, should it some, somewhere it identify that we teach? This, this, this is why mission statements are um, very specific to your district. And if that is, again, looking at what missions do, it's looking at what core uh, work and responsibility of the district is. And so that is a very valid um, point to be making that the, that, per, that the word teach or learning, that there's, there's a difference between teaching and learning. Um, you know, and what, how do you want that communicated? Okay, this is Whitfield and then Mrs. McQuinn. I just wanted to address Mrs. McQuinn's comment because I think it's really important. Um, sometimes this uh, meeting can sometimes exist without students um, being talked about as the primary focus or sometimes they're lost in the adult stuff. And so I really think um, the opportunity for us here to really refocus ourselves on, on students uh, is a great one. Like I think we, we should really put the mission of this, this district as students because we know that the adults will um, kind of be considered in, in that process, in the way that they serve as students. I don't want us to turn into, um, you know, mentioning each employee group or even employees as, as the main part of our mission, because I really think they always get recognized. The issue is that we don't always make sure that we, that we probably make them a priority. So I think as a decision, we should lean towards just students in the mission. Dr. Robin? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. McQuinn, you were, you were after, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. Response to um, teach. We can teach all day long, but students necessarily learn. So I would rather focus on student learning. I understand. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So, okay, so I know I'm upsetting the apple cart a bit, but I think we need to start with the portrait of a graduate. What, like, I'm sorry? I think we need to start with the portrait of a graduate. What do we want young people, what skills, talents, characteristics do we want our graduates? And then in my mind, then one, one that's the equity point <laughs> where we're trying to go, but, and, and then I think our mission and vision connects us to that. Or at least that's how I see it. I'm, and it, do, it yeah. focuses on the students, but then we don't have to say all that stuff in the mission statement. I, I do think it should be short. I think it should be student focused. Um, I think our, our purpose, I'm sorry, I know our core, what, what we're, our core business is teaching and learning, but we're really, 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 really much more than that, right? right? And, and and what I've been push, pushing for for 20 years is for us to embrace that and not to do everything, but to connect to others to help create this, this, this to take every, every student, move them to this, whatever, whatever this definition, this portrait of a graduate is. And then if we focus on that, that's your, your mission. That's your focus, that's your prize. That's it, the, the portrait of the graduate. And then when we back map, we look at we look at the gifts and blessings each child has or do, does not have and figure out what we need to do, you know, in, individually and collectively to get that ch child to that point. And that's where real that's where equity the verb comes in. That's e equity the noun that I'm talking about here. But I don't know, that's just the way my brain processes it. I just can't can't really I just can't really figure out what the mission and vision should be unless I know where I'm trying to go. So you're not upsetting the apple cart at all, and I'm tracking with you. Um, and what uh, what you're talking about with the portrait of a graduate um, is actually um, where the vision piece would be coming in and of what you want to see. So your portrait of a graduate, what are they going to graduate you know, with, um, who they are, the skills that they take with them, you're absolutely correct that the great way to frame um, frame this, um, looking at here's what our out is that we're desiring, and, and then how do we backwards map that through our, our system to ensure that it's ha happening. And um, so that is um, a, a place where people look at for their vision statement, 
where uh, some of those, you know, make, making it longer because mission is intended to be short, short the vision you can very much expound on, on. And it could be that one of your other approaches would be, we're looking at this, this portrait of a graduate, this, this is what we want to happen, and this is how we're going to get there um, through the vision. So um, I would like to capture what you just said related to the portrait of a graduate, and would you be um, okay with, with us moving it into the, the box related to vision as um, a, a, a place and a concept that would work? Would you be all right with us, Nat? You're generating awesome thoughts here. Um, the, the, there's only one thing I would um, uh, suggest as a, as a piece, of what, piece of whatever your final wording is, is, is that in purposes of inclusion, to avoid using um, uh, things that are obviously gender-based, like, like his or her, and um, the preferred terminology is they or theirs. Go ahead, Dr. Robinson. So, despite the fact that a part of mission is vision and statements multiple times, I still don't understand the difference. So, I just follow, follow you guys with this. But, but the language that, that Ms. Ayala read, that racially affirming is important. Um, and I really think that that helps to get to what I see as some of our core obstacles. Ms. McGuinn and Mrs. Whitfield. I, I love this stuff. So, if, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I, after all these years, there's also sometimes I stumble over the difference having trained the mission and vision. Okay, okay. So the mission is short. It's it's what we dream, and the vision is how we're, we're going to get there. And so I our racial identity, and I know I have the word wrong there, is being part of our vision. Because again, every student will graduate late prepared for the future they dream, going back to that. that. It should be short. You gotta be able to see it, say it. And then the vision include the, the other stuff. Mrs. Whitfield. Thanks, actually, you just um, touched on something that's really important to me. Um, when that fir first uh, line where it was every student is known by name, that kind of jumped, jumped out at me as, um, Kind of an indicator of the LGBT piece um, because I feel like, like one of the struggles we've had in this district is, is getting teachers to call kids by the name that they choose and so um, to put in there a, a piece about name and then I heard some of the other ones um, do you have his her and and I feel like, like that gets really tricky so we should um, either leave out completely or we're gonna have to have to throw in a his her and theirs um, and and I think that could get a little cumbersome. So that first one I really like because it doesn't um, gender anybody in it. And so I, li I like I like that part of it that we can really just keep it very um, equitable from an LGBT perspective. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, the the name name piece. I'm really glad you centered on on that because there's an awful lot that is contained in that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a district that sits, um, has 120 languages spoken. And so the issue of people's names is very big. Um, can you say my, my name correctly? Have you taken the time to learn you know, what, what names mean? Um, and I, because I'm in the adjacent district, that has been a huge issue for us. And part of really part of our training for staff is to ensure that people's names are honored. Um, it's not up to you to de de determine what nickname they will be called. Um, it, 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 so there's there's a lot, and, and bringing up the LGBTQIA piece, so there's, there's a lot um, that's encompassed when using the terminology of saying that we know someone's name. Ms. McGuinn. Um, I so we could also put that by name in the vision. And I shared with Mary in our individual first meeting that, and this is where I get nervous, Don Robinson knows this piece, that I, I 
I may say this wrong, but I'm, but I'm going to say it as it happened. When, when I was, I think, a first year teacher, it was definitely in my first couple of years as teaching, and I had uh, about an equal balance of um, black students and, and white students, and I I don't remember, this bothers me that I don't remember his, his exact name, so I'm going to say it's William. But when I was speaking to them, um, and I just, I, I said, Will. And he, he stood up, and he said, not call me out of my name. And that's exactly how he said it. And I learned very early on, don't give me a nickname. I'm William. So I do think that's very important. But Mr. Barber, if I might add, I think, think this is an interesting one because my, 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 my worldview is the same as what, what Mr. Queen just examined. My father was very clear to me that your name is Donald. It is not Don. It's not any of those things. And so I've done that to my children. But more important, I think, as a teacher and as an educator, if that's something that we aspire to, it will force behavioral ch changes in adults. Because now you have to look at someone and ask a question. And I think that would, that would be the goal of something that specific from my perspective. Dr. Robinson? And I think that, that um, knowing the name is part of my, we see you, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Because with every name comes a story. And when we know people's stories, it starts to change some, some things. Um, we start to develop understanding and some empathy. Um, and so all of this is very much tied to both individual work, work, corporate work, and culture change. And I would add, I think for all of us, I think, you know, when you think about um, Italian families, you know, Haitian families, African families, so part, part of the assimilation in America sometimes is to give, give up your name. Change it so that other people can say, say it correctly or spell it correctly. And I think it. I think this. This is, and it's an interesting. This has sparked this conversation because, because I think for some of our kids, the society or the system makes them not appreciative of their name and their heritage and their value. And so I think part of I think something it would seem so small to really help our children build their self confidence in being able to art, maybe maybe even research their name, articulate their name. You know, you know, my last name is Fanoy. Okay, well that's that's not African. So what's the story behind? this black family having a French name, right? And so these, and so, so you start to, well, they must be Haitian. Well, no, that's not. We're not from Haiti, but we may have came through Haiti. So it's, so it's just, it's interesting how something like this, this could be such a powerful changer for us. Because I think a lot of our kids, you know, you know, again, not maybe intentionally, but sometimes they're embarrassed by their name because it's hard to say. Or other pe people struggle with it, and they say, well, I'll just call you this. So to Ms. McQuinn's point, I think that's a big, big thing to, is, I got to write that one down. I, I never thought about it like that. Dr. Robinson. Okay, so I just, since we're talking about, talking about names, I just feel the need to tell you the story, and I'm going to try to, try to make it short. So when we had the, the last workshop, I think it was when, when the Florida School Board Association lady um, started, she asked me what she could call me. I think she asked me if she could call me Deborah or something. And I froze, right? But let me just tell you something. So when I was an intern, I'll try to be brief. When I, when I was an intern, long story short, many, most nurses were on the med search floor older than I am, right? And they all called each other by their, their first name. I called them by their first name. They called me by my first name, right? Until probably three weeks into my internship, this older black nurse and God knows what she must have gone through, right? Because she was older and had been you know, there, like the you know only black nurse on the floor, whatever, right? Right. This woman literally grabbed me and threw me into a closet to tell me I must never, ever allow them to call me by my first name because my ancestors fought so I would have the opportunity. Go to medical school. This woman read me to riot act. I didn't know this woman, okay, until then, right? But she made, made it crystal clear to me that my name was Dr. Robinson, and my name was Dr. Robinson because of my ancestors, right? Not me, not my ego. So I just put.
that out there because I know some, sometimes I will say, Dr. Robinson, there's, there's been times on this day, it's not recently when the board chair referred to me as Deborah, and I said, Dr. Robinson, but that's that was that nurse, whatever her name was, okay, making me stand up for my ancestors. So I just I would be just clear about that. That it's not an ego thing, right? It's, a, it's an ancestral thing. So, all right, thank. You. Clarify that, Dr. Robinson. I don't think I've ever called, called any of you by your first name board meeting. I try and always call you by your proper name. So hopefully it wasn't me you were referring to some other board, board chair. Um, go ahead, Mary. Hey, um, this is a really powerful conversation. Um, and I'm I'm glad that these pieces are coming out. And isn't it interesting, all the th things that have been raised by the few simple words, know a student by name, strength, and need. And so there's a, a lot wrapped up, um, up in it, and uh, you've generated quite a bit. Um, and in the, the interest of balance of time to be able to talk, talk about mission a little bit, um, I'm going to ask if we can move forward to that piece of um, this work. And we're going to continue doing exactly what we're just doing and, um, with the fact that we're starting with um, one, one piece already which is the concept of um, portrait of a student. And so, again, we want to uh, generate from you and surface some things from you related to words, phrases, and concepts to, to be considered for revisions. And then if there's a um, this desire to make your vision longer so that you can really um, expound on some of the, the things you've, I, um, you've daylighted that you want covered, that's a place that, that you can do that in um, several different par paragraphs. Um, vision can be... As, as long as you want. Again, this is, is very district dependent. So, um, Mr. Barbieri, I'll turn it over to you to call on folks. Okay, let me ask you a question, Mrs. Fertakis. Um, I've been calling you Mary, I apologize, but it was easier than Ms. Mrs. Fertakis, but I'll try and remember. Um, you have a good relationship with high and public, public schools in case we steal their mission statements and sue us? Absolutely. I've already talked to them about this. Um, I have a very strong relationship with both superintendent and many members of their board. I co-presented with their board chair on a number of occasions. Okay, great. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. Sorry, I have so many opinions about all this. Um, the In the vision, one of the things that really jumped out for me in that first one is a joy of learning. And a, a lot of this uh, comes back to having to do home homework with my daughter all the time. Um, and and <laughs> I actually really like Reading Plus. I think Plus is uh, really interesting that they put uh, stories that are, um, you know, really pertinent. There are little clips and you get to read through it. But um, the way that they're presented um, kind of is a little painful to do. And the same thing with IXL. We do a lot of IXL in my house. And um, I, I just feel, feel like I love school. I've always loved school. I thought school was the greatest thing ever. I excelled in it, so it made it, so it was self-reinforcing. You know, people would tell me that I did a great job, and that always made me feel feel really happy. Um, but I can see on some of our children that, that they don't love to come to school, that they struggle with, with being there. They don't feel like uh, it's for them, that they're not being seen and heard, and, and they don't want to do it. And and, and I and that, to me, is really sad. And so when I see this joy of learning, learning like, in five years, if we could have this district instill a like, joy of learning in our students, I, I really think we would just see our reading scores go through the roof, our math scores go through the roof, because as kids would want to be there, and they would feel engaged in their education. So I just love the piece, and, and it really resonated with me, um, just, just really because of all the homework, though. Um, and watch, watching her struggle through it is hard. Someone else has have a comment? Mrs. Andrews? Well, I like the piece when we're trying to get our students ready. Uh, many times our students start out uh, in first grade and they really haven't mastered the kindergarten skills. And when we think about having children ready uh, to be able to be successful by third grade, that we've got to look at, at the early portions so uh, the piece that I think about a lot is to make sure that, that we have our children ready uh, when they enter kindergarten so that they can be successful by the end of the third grade. 
Anyone else? Like Mrs. Ayala. Ayala. Thank you. Uh, I had thought that adding dream somewhere to vision was some, something that I would like to see um, because again, focusing to what we hope in the future for the graduates, as Dr. Rob Robinson so eloquently put it, the portrait of a gra graduate, um, who do we want them to be, right? And I think that that piece from the mission where we're leading, leading with a holistic approach, get them to a point where they're, they're successful, where they have dreams and goals, where they, where they feel like whole people that are able to leave our di district and go out into the global economy, which is these I liked the, the globalness of what education means, means today in the 21st century and forward. I think that it's important that we think about who do we want that person to be, what qualities did that person acquire because of the great, great work of this district. So that was how I was trying to, trying to reframe it because again, went back to reading this and to say it simply, it just didn't hit me. It has all these, all these big long words that if I read and I, and I really try to understand something, but at first glance, it, it leaves me very uninspired. Dr. Robin. Okay, so we're talking about vision right now, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So, um, I don't know, in my mind, the vision is just going to be very long. Because <laughs> I just feel like I want to detail a lot of bullet points in vision, right? But, uh, but I think that in the vision is where the the okay the vision is the how okay so right so I, I think in the vision is where language with such including racially affirming goals um i actually like components of each of these samples um i love that i want excellence in there <laughs> um how that gets defined um, mm -hmm. now, now, it's something about the lesson with shared responsibility, school at home and community. I think don't like shared responsibility though. And the only reason is because I don't, I heard too many times where school district employees would essentially blame the parent. And that statement to me leaves room for saying you weren't doing your, your part, right? When in actuality, what I'm saying, the way I see equity work, if, um, if, if you are not so blessed that you can like sit with your ch child and do their, the homework with your child, that we would see to it that there's some kind of, some filling of the hole, whether it's after school tutoring or it's a com community-based um, program that supports education, whatever. But so I, so I, I don't, I don't like share responsibility for that reason. I'm not, I'm not really sure if I'm, if I'm making myself clear. But I just don't want, want to have anything that you didn't, you didn't do your part, right? For that, I, I can add, can add a little context to the conversation or that this district had that led to this. And it was around the exact issue that you're raising that um, that goes back again, again to a basic word that um, I think I referenced when we spoke last time. If I didn't, it's one I usually say. In the education sector, uh, in my uh, humble opinion, the word, word those should be eradicated. Those kids, those parents, those neighborhoods, those schools. It's very marginalizing. It's um, used all the time. People who hear that said know exactly what it's uh, referring to. And in its place is the word, uh, should be the word our. Our students, our families, our schools, our, our neighborhoods. And that indicates a collective, a collective responsibility and a shared ownership in the, the success of, of each of those. Um, so that was the, the conversation that they were having and coming to understanding that um, because of some of the changes and demographics happening in their district, they definitely had been treating um, historically marginalized groups as those, and that this was part of their culture shift um, to be talking about a shared res responsibility for success. Dr. Robinson. 
So, so I think that we would need to have some significant culture change in Palm Beach County before those words would be viewed that way. If that's in my in, in my opinion. Um, I think something like collective collective effort or something. I, I, I like I don't know the word, that, but I think it's responsibility the word that triggers me um, when it, in the context of Palm, Palm Beach County culture, which is to blame. I, I, that's just what, ha what happens. And you know, and let me just say this, this is not unique Palm Beach County or education. Doctors do it too. too. So if you're not responding to medicine the way we think you should, we're going to blame you because you're not doing whatever you're supposed to do. So that's what happens when people, people are trying and they're unsuccessful. They blame the other person. So, yeah. Great, great points. No, no, I appreciate that because um, you're bringing up a really important principle in any of this work, which is things that can be perceived as coming from a deficit place um, or, or, or deficit language. And if there are words that because of your, of your local context trigger something that would be, would be considered um, from a place of deficit, then it, it absolutely should be um, very intentionally looked at and an alternative uh, look, um, put in place. Vice, Vice Chairwoman Woman Grill. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to what Ms. Sayer said. I, I felt the same way, way uninspired by our vision. And I agree with Dr. Robinson when she was saying that at certain words jump out. You know, you need to look, look at some of them. Looked at the words and the examples that we got. The things that jump out to me, I would love to see us work into our vision statement. And I don't have a problem with the lengthy vision statement. I think the vision needs to be short. I think the vision can be longer. But the words that jump out to me, to me are cultural heritage, dream, foundation of equity or equity. We've got that in there. Mutual respect, cultural responsiveness, suit of excellence, and and community. Maybe that's that word that replaces responsibility. And Dr. Robinson is right. It's going to take a big culture ch change in this district. But I think if those word words are a part of it, we can start to, to drive that. Because those are the words that really capture what I think we need to be. be, be it's our North Star, what we, we, where we want to go. And those are the words that are going to get us there. Would you be willing to, re to repeat that list of words? Um, Kathy was doing, doing a wonderful job typing, but I'm not sure if she was able to, able to capture each one that she shared. Do you want me to go back? Go back? Because I, I, have have, them, I have highlighted. Yes, yes, I have cultural heritage, dream, mutual respect, pursuit of excellence, community. Well, you missed the equity. Right, so equity, we had foundation of equity or equity, mutual respect. Pursuit of, of excellence and community. So you get it all in my New say, York speed. This meeting is recorded, so <laughs> I will be watching it. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Ms. McQuinn. Oh, I can't stand it. Okay. So it, I agree. agree. Short mission, vision is the how. It has all those words. I'm, I'm taking really good notes here, too. So, Kathy, you can let me know. <laughs> I think, though, and it goes back to what Dr. Robin says, yeah, we need all of our community. We need all that, but we have the responsibility. And I don't, I just, I don't want to put, that's part of our strategic plan. It's some strategies that we employ, that we engage our community and et cetera, all of that. Just, I think I, our, I love the portrait of the graduate, and that's it's in there for however we do it. And then, you know, we put in the racially affirming, the cultural heritage. Those are sort of some things that mean something. I, but I think our words, every single word needs to be an important word. And so I'm going to give the joy of learning. I guarantee you, my grandson ne never, never, never will experience the joy of learning. <laughs> He likes the joy of fishing, so, um, but he, he will learn, okay? Um, so I don't, I don't even know if we can define joy, what your joy might be. So I'm, I really love going to the words that, that we know exactly what it means for most, most people. And I can live with Dr. Robinson's excellence, but I don't even know what you and I both agree on is excellence. So I'm just I'm putting it out, out there for very specific words. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. 
and I've got a, got a specific word if it hasn't already been said, is to inspire and inspire all students to attain the, the highest levels of achievement. And I have, haven't heard anyone say too much about the social and emotional piece there, not just the, the academic piece. The academic piece is very important, but the social and emotional piece, I think, needs to be somewhere. Go ahead, Mr. Fatakis. Yeah, yeah I, I would uh, concur with the, the social emotional piece because that's actually getting back to your conversation around, around uh, names in the middle. Um, these are sort of the things that create the conditions where people will know that they are seen, um, that they are welcomed, that it's an inclusive environment, and, um, and all of that is part of social emotional uh, well-being. And we know that when that's in place, that, that's where we see a lot of culture shift happening because that gets into the heart of what's happening every day in your learning environment. Okay. okay. All right, um, so uh, just want to make sure, sure uh, um, in looking at this, is, is there a concept, word or phrase that we have not captured yet in on the vision piece, piece of this? Dr. Robinson. Um, so, but in the vision somewhere, one of these, these paragraphs or bullet points is something has to talk about the staff, right? So it, we, I don't know exactly what the right words are, but we need to have staff that also inspire, right? We have to address the social emotional wellness of our staff, right? Um, and just like as, as a sidebar, I was in this conversation the other day of, about what I call the heavy, the concentrated poverty and the burn that ha happens there. And that's the equity issue. I'm just throwing that, that out for you now. But just the, the, the emotional burden that some staff has experiences when, and, and worse because of the pandemic, but when they're tr trying, they're doing everything they know to do. Um, and maybe not having success or the level of success that they want. And, and then that's a burden on them. So somehow we have to, to in here, in this whole vision, talk about how we not only support our staff professionally, but also emotionally, I th think. Ms. Fertakis, what do you think? Yes, I mean the, this is the, the, the your your teaching staff and, and your staff are you know when we talk about equity and how uh, our people people are resourced. Um, yes, it, it's it's a critical piece because if you're experiencing trauma yourself, it's going to be um, getting translated across to the children that you're coming in uh, contact with, and um, I do quite a bit of work on the social and learning. In the, at, at that space, um, and this has be, become uh, a huge issue as a result of. I mean, it, it should have been an issue before, before if we were looking at our data with staff turnover and how how we're losing people and people not not just not losing them just from your your schools, losing them from the profession um, and lack of supports there. And the, the pandemic has 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 highlighted and daily that even more. So this issue of addressing. Uh, and and the, when you focus on social emotional um, tools for your staff, it's it's a twofer because it's helping them for their own own social emotional needs, and they're now um, in a space where they can also be teaching this to the the students that they come in contact with. With so it's a it's an investment that yields dual um, benefits um, when when we're talking about professional development around that. So it, it's definitely something to be um, considered. And, and you know, as you move forward into your strategic plan, um, I've yet to see one that doesn't have a third, that doesn't talk about, about staff um, in some way, shape or form, because they're the ones who um, need your support to, to help you recognize, uh, realize the vision that you're trying to create and um, the mission that you're trying to um, carry out. So, um, 
I'm hearing, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to stop the conversation if someone has something thing to say, but I do want to um, move you to a couple points to see if we can get some consensus. Uh, what I am hearing on the vision um, is a, a, a desire to have it be not a, a short, short statement, one or two sentences, but, but something that is longer that would allow you to expound on a number of concepts um, uh, as your how. But um, I, again, since I can't see everyone, can uh, you do a, a test of the room or take a temperature of the room, um, Barbieri, with a thumbs up, up sideways or down, um, that piece? I see a head shaking, thumbs up, up. So I think it's, I think, I think you, you got it. Um, okay. I, Mrs. McQueen wanted to make a comment. So if we could just pause a second. I, I just wanted, okay, I know we wordsmith later. It's just, I like employees so much better than staff. I don't know why. More syllables. Softer syllables. <laughs> I just like an employee better thing. Let's capture this. Um, everything's on the table right now. Um, and and uh, what I, this one may be a little tougher. So if you want it a little bit longer um, in the vision. In this um, second pair of uh, the column where we put state for include as a component with um, its own paragraph part of the vision, um, would love to see if there are um, some concepts or, or areas that you would like, like to highlight as a part of this. I mean, it's clear to me one of them is this portrait of a, a, a graduate, which would be something that, that, that allows you to then back to map what happens throughout your system. But um, that's just what I'm seeing. But I want to, since this is yours, uh, I want to see are there some, uh, we're, we're thinking broader in a category of something that's sort of your how that, that you'd like to see a paragraph around. Um, um, if we could generate some of those ideas, that would be great. Dr. Robinson. So, so part of my how is acknowledging the importance of family and community and empowering them to be partners, like equal partners, but not with the responsibility piece. I'm still stuck on that. But but I know that, you know, we, we act as though only our employees can deliver anything called education. And it's not really true, right? And so, and we have, our systems have taken the voice away from um, some communities and some individuals in those communities who are re ready, willing, and able to, to step up, and especially as we look at this COVID slide deal. And so I would li like the how to include the acknowledging of the strengths, the talents, the power of the community, and, and especially those that we don't typically listen to. So, yeah, that's one of my how. You're, you're on, Ms. Fadakis. Mr. So, okay. I, I just um, wanted to expand, expand on what um, Dr. Robinson just said, because it really res resonates with me um, in the nonprofit organizations in this community, and I think that should be added in. So the communities and um, outside organizations within this community that do support work, because, I mean, they are always asking how they can help schools, and so to be able to actually work with them um, more effectively, I think, um, could give us extra benefits uh, um, for all the students and the employees. Mrs. McGuinn. I'm going to continue to put my plug on plug in that, um, that we keep this focused on students and that, that our community involvement be in our, our strategic plan as to how we do this, this for our students. Now go come back to the words that I loved is our racially affirming the equity, the cultural heritage, knowing them by name, et cetera. Those are all student. Mm -hmm. And then how we do that is through our strategic plan. Just my preference, but I'll keep, I'll keep bringing us back to that. Ms. Andrews, then Dr. Robinson. Yes, there's so many different type of stakeholders, and certainly the community is one. We have our elected officials. We have uh, many times educators who are actually retired from the system. 
so that we have a, a whole abundance uh, of uh, stakeholders that we can identify that, that have so many resources that can uh, be inclined to be used to supplement what we do here, here uh, in the classroom as well as with the school district. Dr. Robinson. So one of the things that um, since we keep talking about student-centered, so yeah, and people come in when they say that they want to help school, I want, want them to help the student, right? And the school looks, looks better as a as a outcome of that, right? Because what I don't want to do is um, is is possibly reinforce this school grading game that goes on, because so many children get hurt hurt in that. That I really, you know, when they want to help help. Let's talk about the children that, that they're going to help. Um, and I, and actually that's always been positively received when I would, would kind of turn the conversation a bit. You know, so. Ms. Ritakis. I, I, I um, want to throw a couple of um, ideas for consideration for you um, in looking at this, since the vision in, encompasses different aspects of your, your system. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, you touched on the social emotional well being of students and employees. Um, um, and we've talked about a little bit, a bit about academic uh, outcomes. And so, so there was uh, a preference for including the word excellent um, in, in whatever, is, um, whatever your final draft is. But, but a couple of things I'm not hearing that uh, cover di different aspects and uh, just keep the, the, the way our conversation has gone, but I want to raise them for your consideration. Um, one would be, um, in, as part of your agenda, what about parity in your facilities? Did you say parity? Yes. Doesn't parity sound more like equal than equitable? Um, what you would need to be, look, that's why I used the word parity, because it's not exactly the same. If you were looking at um, your facilities, would you be able to say to someone, um, yes, we have invested the um, resource into ensuring that these are facilities, buildings that um, are contributing to equitable access and opportunity. So I see parity work when you're comparing phys physical structure, not students. So parity to me, when you're talking about students, every every student gets exactly the same thing, which is not what we want, right? But certainly we're talking about, and I'm Mrs. Uh, Paul, Paul knows exactly what school I'm referencing when I won't say it, but when we're looking at parity for schools, every school should be appealing and aesthetically pleasing to the, to the parents that are looking at them so that they don't see a difference, you know. So parity in that respect, but does that really belong in a vision statement when we're talking about? That's what I'm, that's what I'm uh, referring to because you're talking about your di district. And like I said, there's different aspects of your district. There's your stu students, there's your staff, there's your facilities, there's your budget allocation. You know, is part of your vision going to be um, distributing resources as we fully determined them um, and your budget is it going to be done um, in a manner that that promotes you know is that something you want want called out in um, a vision statement as to how you're going as part of your how um, and because again this is part of your how and so it's requiring lots of different things Mrs. Whitfield, well, let me let me just say yes, yes, and more yes. I would <laughs> really, really like it if we thought thought about about um, how we distribute resources within the district. Um, sometimes I, I feel like it doesn't make sense to me, so I'm constantly, constantly having meetings with Miss Paul to ask her, you know, what's happening at this school versus versus that school, and how come we've got something that my schools don't don't have. So, um, you know, I, I think having that in there would be ama amazing, and talking about how we. You know, we have such limited resources, how we give out all the resources and make sure that they're going to the place, places that need them and the, the biggest problem areas first, I think it's a wonderful idea. Mrs. Andrews. We just don't only have academic gaps, we have facility gaps, uh, we have uh, structural gaps, 
So I think when you're talking about, about the budget and, and, and how to close both these gaps, uh, you've got to kind of look at the funding that's need needed. So you have to assess the whole di district, the total district, uh, your physical uh, facility, uh, your uh, curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, uh, your t teachers, all of these gaps. We've got gaps because we have teachers who have less experience than others when you start talking about equity, which is that we may have to put money in the budget to be able to recruit and inspire uh, the best talent to go into schools that need it. So, so when you start talking about this parity, it's a big deal because we know where our schools are as it relates to parity and what kinds of things, things that will need to be done. And some of that is, is going to be financial. Some of it can be otherwise, but uh, we need to make sure that's somewhere in the statement because we've got a lot of places to look at right here in this big Palm Beach County. Mrs. Whitfield. I just wanted to add, add one more um, thought and, and, you, and you guys can think about where this is best. Um, but we have this whole idea around the whole child that we talk about. I think we should try to um, include that. It includes so many different, different aspects of social emotional learning, um, you know, feeding, which is, which is huge to me always, employee wellness, physical environment, family engagement, community involvement, and so uh, social and emotional climate, counseling, PE, <laughs> nutrition. So it's like as we talk, talk about the whole child, if that fits in, into probably maybe in the how, but also into the, the vision. Um, I think that would be a really good way to capture the work, work that's already being done in this district and then really highlight it so that going forward, we really think about that um, as, a, as a core component of the work that we're doing. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So I'm pushed back on the word parity. Um, I don't know. It sounds like equal to me too. And I just don't want to have, have anything that's misinterpreted. Um, I, I do think that it needs to talk about the resources, including the budget. Um, you know, you know, the way I always say it is, is disproportionately um, provided to, to those in most need, but you know, it would be, be different words in the in the vision statement. Um, and I think um, I'm not sure if I can clear, clearly see what Ms. Whitfield is saying, I mean, it's the concept of the whole child, child but and, but I'll, I'll, I'll follow it. But I think, think for me, that portrait of the graduate is the description of the whole child graduating. And, and what does this, what, what are all those components of that young person? And I guess, guess maybe you're talking about the bad mapping of the diff different, okay, I'm catching on. But okay, okay. So yeah, but I, I absolutely think that the vision state statement should talk about the resources. Ms. Griftakis. Okay, and so we're going to unfortunately our time constraints wrap wrap this up at this um, time for this portion of it. Um, but you've generated a ton of wonderful. Um, ideas, concepts, words, um, and words you don't want to use and that we should be very cognizant of. And uh, would just encourage any of the, the board members, if there are, there are other things that come up for you um, as you've had a chance to reflect on this piece, please don't hesitate to um, provide those to, to Kathy and she'll be very happy, happy to incorporate them into this document, which will be uh, uh, written up and uh, as a, a part of your work as we continue going forward. And we did could come to consensus that you want something longer for your vision, which is actually going to be very helpful for you to be able to incorporate all the things you want to see in it um, as you are uh, developing your how. And, and this is then going to feed into your strategic planning work because these things that you're talking about and identifying in the vision are absolutely going to be showing up in the strategic plan because this how has to be operationalized um, over the next five years as, as you move forward on that. So um, thank you so much for your engagement on this piece. Um, and I'm now going to turn it over um, to Mr. Tierney. Can we put the slides back up, Mark? Thank you. 
Um, so in consultation um, with, this is for talkies, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, everything that the board has kind of tasked um, the superintendent and his staff with is reflected in this timeline. Um, ag again, you know, this is something Dr. Noyes and his comments, you know, we've heard we, we want equity as a pillar in the strategic plan, but we need to set strong foundation to, to make sure that that does happen. So as Mary she shared um, and Mr. Tierney shared in the beginning of this workshop, you know, you know that entails the foundational work around completing um, the mission and vision revisions um, to Dr. Rob Robinson's point, uh, really making sure that, that we all coalesce around a working definition for equity uh, since, you know, Mrs. Furtak has been very um, uh, you know, pushing us to make sure that this isn't something that's just coming from the school board, but that we workshop with others in the community, um, especially our students, um, and then making sure, sure that those changes are reflected in our equity policy, not just the definition of, of equity, but also the accountability piece, making sure that we hold our, ourselves accountable for this work. And so, and so I did wanna um, say we, we invited um, Santiago Alvarez to today, but he has a lot of homework. So I do have, have a, a meeting scheduled with him to debrief. Um, so I know, I know he's you know, not the only student voice, but we're trying, trying to leverage him um, as a step, stepping stone to make sure we get everyone. And so really, really thinking about um, you know, his ideas, he said this at the last board meeting, how to engage students. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back with him because again, you know, we're, we're talking about students, but want, want to make sure that they're represented in this conversation. Um, so you see some time there. Uh, Mr. Mr. Burke and um, Knus were here talking about the budget process. So again, you know, if there are any changes um, or priorities that need to be serviced prior to the final budget adoption, in light of everything that's hap happening um, with the state budget, uh, you know, it's just some, something for us to think about. And as Mary said, our definition of, of resources just needs to be brought in. We just need to continually remind ourselves that yes, dollars matter, but that there are other things that we should be looking at. Uh, and then. We talked on November 10th about, about the board workshops um, and aligning those to the desired outcome, outcomes of our equity policy, right? So what is our current state as it relates to those outcomes and having the board talk about, about what is our ideal state? How do, do we get there? Um, before we can talk about that, we, we need to know where we are. And as part of that, that process, incorporating the, the marginalized voices, students, parents, teachers, to come, come to the table to really speak to that. Also leveraging um, the work that's going on in the community. I know the Children's Services Council is doing work on, uh, on equity. I participated in the uh, um, West Palm Beach work um, uh, that Mayor James is doing and, and his work listening to the elders and how powerful that was. How can we make sure that, again, as a county, we're kind of coalescing around this because it seemed like, you know, y'all the only ones um, going on this journey, so leveraging those re resources since we know they're scarce, but making sure that, that we all kind of end up in a place that's, that's that's better for everybody in Palm Beach County. So I will come back and, and bring that to the board in January so y'all can see the plan. And they'll also be tied to the barriers that Mrs. Fertakis helped identify in her one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. So kind of this, this alignment of you know desired outcomes um, who in the community or even from Council of Great City Schools can we leverage to kind of give y'all some out, outside kind of best practices to that desired outcome, what work the district's done, you know, to, to get to our current state, you know, identify what has to happen to get us there. So this was portrait of a graduate in a lot of ways as well, I think, into that work. And then the, the barriers that y'all identified in your one-on-one -on -one conversations earlier. So I think I see a question. Mm -hmm. This is what Thank you. Um, I actually, actually just wanted to ask a little bit of a question to the, the superintendent about this work. My understanding is we are um, out of money to pay, pay Mrs. Fertakis to keep going um, on this work and that it's going to be largely internal from now on. Um, I'm a little, little concerned about that. Um, I, I know you're wonderful. Ms. Villavicencio, but um, I don't want to overburden you or other staff. And I'm, I'm a little concerned because sometimes we get stalled when things are just internal. Um, and I like this outside push. I kind of just wanted to ask the superintendent his thought on, on uh, going forward. Um, you know, it, this work, we've tried it so many times. Um, 
well before I got here. I know it's how it started, um, and we've done it a few times since I've been here, and I'm afraid to lose the momentum we've, we've gained. So um, if you have any thoughts, I would love to hear on what you think on that. Yeah, I'll turn over to Mr. Tierney talked about a little earlier today. So Ms. Vertox, her, the grant and her contract expires basically at the end of this work. We've found it to be tremendously helpful, so we're going to continue to search for outside fund sources to help help her help us guide us in this work, and we will handle internally the things that we're able to, having lived through the creation of the last, last strategic plan. So it's going to be a combination of doing the mechanics of the things that we saw and know-how with hopefully bring, bringing back the expertise as we identify additional funds. Mr. Tierney, I, I, I agree. I think Mrs. Fertakis is, in, you know, exceptionally helpful, and I would if we weren't going to continue work, working with her. I think, I think if we approach the Education Foundation, I mean, what's more important to them than how we make sure that we teach every child in this district uh, and give them the resources they need. So I would, I would reach out to, you know, President Gavrilos and ask they give us some help with keeping her with us while. Absolutely. Dr. Robinson. So I will support that too. Um, I have to say though, Mrs. Woodfield, I don't remember in 20 years is the board talking about equity. And, oh, so you're talking about the strategic plan. The mission and vision oh, and all okay, that okay, work okay. to tie so, in equity. I think yeah. you know, we well, touched you know, on it, I'll but we never forgot this, on this equity thing. But, <laughs> but, and, but I, I, I definitely support um, asking somebody to find the money to continue working with this for Takas. Did I just mess it up? No. Nope. For Takas. Okay. okay. So, um, but I also, I also, also want to throw out there too. So, Palm Beach County is a member of the Gov Government Alliance for Racial Equity. <laughs> And they have two kits and, and stuff, stuff. Like I, I really have not explored their work, um, but I would ask maybe that um, Kathy V and, and Mr. Tierney um, would um, look at what is available through them. I think um, James Green is the really the main kind of contact, but I know that they have some kind of like tools where you walk through whether your organization is actually working towards equity, but I haven't seen them. And so I think that we could maybe use those um, to provoke our thinking. Um, but definitely, I do think that we need to bring Ms. Amfitakis back to lead us because um, this, if, if we do this right, it's going to get tense. So thank you. This is Andrew. Absolutely, we have such heavy lifting. We have to bring Ms. Bertakis back. We're, we're just babies beginning this process, and you have done this work. So, uh, ditto Erica, Mrs. Whitfield, and Dr. Robinson. I just want to make sure I'm on this that we have to find the money. I mean, when you put in the inside, it's different. We need this outside of the approach to tell us those kinds of things, or at least educate us on the things that we, we need to find so that we can do the kinds of things that need to be done for this equity lens to be effective and successful for our children. I guess we kind of put you on the spot, Ms. Marcus. Whether you like it or not, or not we want you to stay. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. you. This has been very, uh, I appreciate all of the, the comments, and I would be very, very honored um, to continue working with you if, if it can be worked out. Um, I totally agree from the years I've done this that. It's really important to honor the work going internally and your internal expertise. And it's really helpful to have somebody external who, who can look at things from a different perspective and who continue pushing. Um, and that, um, I wanna go back to the, the timeline very quickly because this is one of the tools that I was, was recommending you use for a number of reasons. And the specific things on that timeline are related to the, the board's work board's engagement in, in, in these processes so that you have a visual of where th things are going and it becomes an accountability tool for you, you to be having you know, to be able to ask questions around okay we said we were going to be at this point um, you know what's going on um, it's also to provide you with some assurances that the work is going on as well as to provide a bit of a framework as this work goes forward for the types of presentations you'll be getting, because you should be getting um, updates regularly how, as, to, as to how these different things are, are progressing and moving along. It also helps staff know what expectations are, and it's back to that circle of accountability that we talked about last time where the board has a role, 
in doing this and, and staff and employees, so I'll, I'll change, change my language, employees um, also have their, their roles in doing it and it needs to be working together. Um, it's also to help show you some of the, the, the intersections of what's going on and what would be happening at the same time um, because you do, do have a structure that allows you to do that. So the timeline piece um, fulfills a lot, a lot of um, different needs for people um, to know we're progressing, holding ourselves accountable. Um, if we have to ask some things, then, then we're having an intentional conversation about it. And it goes on the timeline. Um, I've also suggested us to doing it color coded so that you know everything that's related to your strategic plan would be in one and um, anything related towards workshops that they're, they're going to be doing for their own personal and collective learning around equity and, and racial equity. You know, so you, you have, you can, can see very easily how you're moving on your continuum. Mr. Chairman and the board, um, I think it's, in, so let me just, just go ahead and commit to uh, the request of the board. So the, what, the, the beautiful part about this and the reality, we absolutely need some, someone like Mrs. Fratarkis, but we also need to build internal, internal capacity in order for this to continue beyond the future, right? And so when I say internal capacity of the board, of staff, and then start ex expanding that reality. So what I can commit to when Mike forced us, us to, uh, to look at our budgets, our, our team's budgets, and we started reducing, I was able to reduce, reduce my budget by greater than 10%, I think like 25 and so, and we also have friends of the district that we will be asking. So, so let me just, we will make it happen. So I, I, will, I will find, I'll find a way. Um, Vice Chairwoman Brill and Dr. Robinson. Pass, Dr. Robinson. So I would ask also that, that Dr. Fenoy um, send to each of the board the schedule of upcoming racial equity institute workshops. Um, because I think all, except for one of us has been one time. Um, and I think, um, I just think an important framing for us to really lead into um, what we're talking about. Um, but my question is, so what's, what's the next step with the resource allocation with the equity lens? Because that's, that's, that is a heavy lift. So what's, the, what's the, the, the next step with that? I can jump in here just very quickly because this is where you already already have um, work that's been done that just hasn't been accessed. You had um, a review done um, by ERS, um, Educational Resource um, uh, Research Services, and they, they did an analysis. I actually use, use a lot of their materials when trying to uh, create a structure for, for equitable resource allocation. They have done that. I mean, it's laid out. You, it's very... You can have very intentional conversations about the decisions being made in different categories of resource allocation for the district. So you're not starting from scratch. It's basically it's activating things that have been there um, and sitting there. And now we're trying to put it in this, this framework on a timeline and calling some things out to help it move forward. Okay. Dr. Robinson. May I, may I also ask Dr. Fenoy to consider asking principals their thoughts on, now I get many principals may not be familiar with equity as a concept, but still get, get their input in terms of how they think our um, funding for formulas do not support the student need. If, you know, I guess you might need the words for that, but, but I would like to hear from the principal group as well for just to consider their input. Ms. McQuinn. Um, <clears throat> I think Dr. Robinson was on the board at the time, I don't remember. But when I was, I was a principal, and I was trying to look back, it, when I, I first learned the word that equi equitable is not equal, I was a, a new principal about 25 years ago. And I don't see that we've come much further. But that's when I, when I learned it. I've never forgotten. Equal is not equitable. Um, so it, just the education on that piece, I think, is going to be important. Mrs. Whitfield. I just want to tell Dr. Robinson I am signed up for the January racial equity. I'm excited to go. So if anybody, anybody wants to come, I think it would be fascinating to have, to have us, um, you know, multiple board voices in there. Obviously, it would have to be, to be advertised. But, um, but I think... 
It would be really uh, impactful, and it's virtual, so we don't have to uh, go in the same room or building, so it'll be really nice. I'm looking forward to it. Mrs. Andrews? And thank you, and Mr. Bergman, important point, even though it's not all about the, the financial piece, but when we start looking at, at how schools are allocated their funds, <laughs> and we know where these schools are, we, we know where these children are, and we've had our, our basic sick premise of how we do business here in Palm Beach County for a long time based on this is how we do, do it because this is the way it's been done. And that is a heavy lift when we begin then to restructure that from the lens of equity to get to where we need to go for our children. I think just the last thing in is, you know, the, the work, Dr. Noy said, this is, this is meaningful work. It does take time. I, think, I know with the, the work that Dr. Sheffield and Mr. Oswald are doing around, around the student academic support plan, there's talks of what will it take so that as we engage finance, HR, our operations, it's, okay, what will, can we do in six months, a year, three years, five years? You all talked about this, you know, culture shift. That, that takes time. You know, I know in t talking to... Mrs. Fertakis, Dr. Dr. Fenoy, uh, and his leadership team with Mr. Mr. Tierney, um, you got to get everybody on board or, you know, the, the changes that y'all are ta talking about, you know, the people that actually have to implement at the school level, it's, it might not happen. So, so we got to bring everybody together now with the board's direction, make sure we craft that main, meaningful plan, give them the voice um, in, in that process, make sure that we're being strategic about when things are being rolled out, um, because if, if we mess mess with that bu budget too much, I, I worry about, you know, some of those timelines. So, so we'll, we'll come up with a plan in January, and, and that's part of that strategic planning process. But everything's dependent on when, what's up there. So we, if we have to go sl slower, that's something the board can give us direction on as well. Dr. Robinson. So I want to, to request that that ERS report get shared with, with us, because I don't, I don't know what I called it, it in my handy-dandy laptop. I don't find it. And then, and then the other thing is I just want to throw out there, since, since we haven't, like, the, the audacity dream of fixing this thing, is if we can put in the mix of the conversation right now um, um, to take action later, um, a curriculum audit, right? Because I know, I know. That, that fifth grade math school A is not the, the same as fifth grade math school B, right? And I, I, it, it, we and we somebody outside to come tell us that. Dr. Robinson, actually, you know, when COVID started, we we I had um, we were we were privileged to get a funder to get John Hopkins University to do a curriculum audit. We paused it when when COVID started, so so it's just a matter of me making a phone call to get that reactivated. This is Andrew Andrews. Thank you. Since we have the equity lens, let us pull back out the uni New York University uh, study. I don't know if Mary has seen that, but uh, she has. Uh, I'd like to see it again because it's talking about just what she's talking about. About all that information is here. We haven't looked at it in a long time, and I'd like to know what we've done uh, with with it and what we can do now that we have an equity lens. And I know uh, Mr. Trudeau to close us up with some next step steps, but this this is this makes me excited because you know we planning meeting about the first board workshop be being a, a a mini root cause analysis with the NYU um, study with the ER analysis for the board to see, and similar to what we did today, y'all talk about you know what is causing inequities in the system, and it's not. Let's not talk about money, because we know money is always going to be the thing we point to. What are the real things so that you as a board can explore that using these resources? And then that will really set the, the tenor and the tone, I think, for the rest of the work. So we'll work on that, but I um, appreciate y'all um, highlighting those, those things, because I think that's, that's where I know we, we were head headed. Yeah. Mr. Chair. So for our, our next steps, we're going to work towards finalizing the, the revisions on mission vision. I'll send you, you some drafts, mission and visions prior to the next workshop so you can reflect on that. Uh, certainly this was a good investment of time. This will be worthy of a further investment in time, but as you saw in the timeline, this is a, a sequence of events, one building on the previous, so it's not a conversation that can, can go on forever. We're defining mission and vision. We're gonna have to define equity as well. We'll do that concurrently 
And then I'm going to draw your attention on this slide to both the equity policy, because it makes, makes no sense to define equity for the first time without look, looking through that newly defined ends at that policy and see is, is it serving the purpose that we want. And then also the diversity and equity committee hopefully will, will help us and help the board work toward the definition of equity. So we may well ask them to come up with some draft definitions of equity in order to at least jump, jump start that conversation in January. As far as the inclusion of students, we've start, started that conversation with our student representative. He spoke so elo eloquently and passionately about that. And we've began that be being fully cognizant of the fact that the student voices that, is that we most need to hear are not going to have a seat in this board and will probably take the most effort. So we recognize we have, we have to cast our net widely on that, and we'll do that. And this was the point. As we wind down, I was going to say some, some kind words about Mary, but, but based on the sentiments expressed by the board already, I think that would be redundant. So I'll turn it over, over to Mary for checkout. Thank you. Um, um, and uh, again, uh, we want I, I want to uh, check out with you the same way that we checked in um, and to get just a uh, sense from you. Uh, again, uh, Mr. Barbieri, I'm going to uh, remind you to um, make it let it go around the room um, with, with your, your colleagues, but um, would like, like to close this out with either uh, you sharing either a word or a phrase about how you're leading our time together. Mrs. McQuinn, would you like to go first? Yeah, uh, well, I would accept that I've missed one word there about our time together. What was that word? Oh, uh, uh, just a word or a phrase that um, is reflective of how you're leaving our time together. How I'm seeing our time. Leaving, leaving, leaving our time oh, together. leaving our time. <laughs> Encouraged because I see that, that we are scheduled to number one, have Ms. Patakis back. And um, and to really, because she she makes us she keep moving, right. gives time but makes us keep moving, and um, she can leave us anytime she wants. So we have to behave. So encouraged. <laughs> Go ahead, Miss Ayal. Thank you. Um, I'm feeling like the future looks promising. Mrs. Whitfield. I'm super hopeful. I, uh, this was a lot of fun, actually. I really enjoyed this, and I don't know if you guys know, know I have babies first Christmas week, and so I'm kind of, kind of thinking a lot about that. So I'm very, very excited about all of it. Thank you. This is Andrew. Moving forward. Dr. Robinson. So before I tell you, can I get my, my um, portrait of a graduate conversation started in January? Because I'm, I'm just so stuck that, I, I don't know, somehow the mission and vision be before really really do having these these conversations seems a place to me but whatever but um so where am I? I i am i am maintaining hope that's better than skeptical <laughs> good. <laughs> good good vice chairwoman brill thank you and I, my word is pleased because i i believe that we are going to get where we want want to get and i get to Pick up all the words you already used. Hopeful, I'm pleased, I'm happy we had Mrs. Mrs. Furtakis here to help us get started on this. Uh, I know Dr. Robinson and I've been here the longest and I've heard try to get this, this done for so many years and I thought I tried to help but I guess I didn't because we never really got it done but I, I'm happy this time that we have Mrs. Furtakis to help us get through this and hopefully get to the, to the end of a very long-awaited project. So, if there's not a project. Not a project. Not a pro project. A transformation, transformation. Of, of this school district. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll take your, I'll take your, your wordsmithing. Yes, no problem. Mrs. Mr. Furtakis, Dr. Hope we Dr. Hope you Fenoy? Dr. Oh. Fenoy? Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Fenoy. No, 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 I don't no, know. I'm I good. Just... Um, I, I leave this conversation um, determined. Um, and so, you know, just you know, for, for business purposes, I just want to make sure the chief of staff and his team know all of the documents the board needs to be re reviewed. Um, for the superintendent, let's talk, talk about the John Hopkins um, curriculum audit, because that's, we can just start that over. That money has already been allocated um, from the outside source. So um, no, I'm determined. And I think um, I'm just very proud um, of us putting one foot in front of the other. Mr. Mr. Vertakis, uh, we hope you have a very ha happy holiday season. And we're looking forward to seeing you back with us in January. Thank you. Thank you for the, and I just want to commend all of you. This is hard, hard work, um, and you're diving in, and you're allowing yourselves to get uncomfortable 
and speak truth and upholding the norms that we've talked about. Uh, and and I, 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 my my check out would be, would be um, grateful again, I'm, uh, grateful for the time and grateful for the work you're doing. And um, um, I just want to encourage you, this is going to be making a big impact on your students and those you serve. And I know that's important to you. So thank you. Well, well, you might want to get a letter, get a letter, letter from that school, school district to make sure we'll go coverage. Our general <laughs> counsel probably would like to that. Yeah, not a problem. Let me get back to you with any of these folks. All right, thank, thank you. <laughs> Board members, do you have anything, anything else? else? Mr. Scott, that? You have a motion, motion to adjourn. Motion, motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Ms. Ayala. All in favor? favor. Opposed? Opposed? Motion to adjourn. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays, everyone. The last two and a half years, the Skolnick has handed out more than 10,000 pairs of socks in our community. But, but this, this act of kindness is, is one for the books. Today we celebrate our biggest progress yet. The complete refurbishing of the library and TV here at Memorial Hill.